Uh, I'm incredibly happy to introduce uh, Jan and Joshua. Jeff was unable to join today. I'm going to try to keep this very, very short. Um, the one thing that I'll say is this. Um, Jeff, Joshua, and Jan, and a few other people have spent over three decades doing research in neural networks, uh, in learning representations, and in deep learning in general. And the reason that I think this is significant is that I think it does take that level of commitment and perseverance and like ignoring the waves of distractions that come and the temptation to work on the next little fancy thing even though you kind of know that it's not really going anywhere to actually make big leaps in science in general and in machine learning in particular. So that's it. I'll just leave it at that. 30 years of perseverance. All right, so off you go. Enjoy the tutorial. Oh, sorry, logistics, apologies. Um, we're not going to do, since the room is so big, we're not going to do questions during the tutorial. What we'll do is that they'll finish five to 10 minutes before uh, the two hour mark. And then there are two microphones. One, one I can see over there, and I think the other one is to the left somewhere. Please queue up on the microphones if you have, if you have questions. All right, now, now for real, off you go. <laughs> Thank you, Joaquin. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming so numerous. Uh, we're going to start by uh, an introduction um, by uh, Joshua. Thanks, Jan. So um, let me just say quickly a few words about what deep learning is about. It's about learning representations, and it's about learning multiple levels of representations. And the idea is that these multiple levels are meant to represent different levels of abstraction. And the reason we think this is important is because abstraction gives us generalization. And we've seen in, in recent years um, amazing improvements in applications using deep learning. Uh, it started with uh, speech recognition, then moved on to computer vision, object recognition, and nowadays we're seeing uh, pretty uh, impressive progress in natural language understanding and processing. So let's, let's move on. Um, why is it that these methods are working? So uh, basically four ingredients uh, that we didn't have in the 90s when we were uh, working with neural nets. Uh, a lot more data than we used to have. In order to uh, take advantage of that data, uh, we need very flexible models. The idea is if we want to build AI, we need models that understand the world around us. They need a lot of capacity because the world is complicated. And so they need a lot of data to specify that, that model. Um, and of course, because the models are large, because there are lots of, uh, uh, of data, we need a lot of computing power. But that's not enough. Non-parametric models, uh, classical kernel methods, and so on, have all of the, these three ingredients potentially, but uh, they, they're missing an important ingredient, which I'll tell you about, which is uh, powerful priors or preferences in the space of functions that give us advantage to generalize better and, and defeat the curse of dimensionality, at least to some extent. So basically, uh, this curse of dimensionality is something that really, really important in AI when we are looking at things like uh, images and sounds and, and language. And um, it's, it, it has an exponential nature, exponential in the number of dimensions. So in order to find an exponential, you need other exponentials. And it turns out in deep learning, we're able to use two other uh, tricks, two other uh, priors uh, besides the uh, smoothness priors that are typically used in machine learning. Uh, and that have a compositional nature. So one of them is uh, giving its name to, the, 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 to, to deep learning, deep, deep architecture, and the other is uh, the older idea of having a distributed representation. So I'm going to go through and explain a little bit uh, more about this. In the uh, early days of neural nets with the work uh, on what's called, what was called then connectionism, uh, came a break from older approaches to AI, which were based on symbol manipulation. So when you manipulate symbol and you work with rules and so on, you're thinking of symbols as sort of pure objects that don't have um, uh, in, in, uh, a built-in similarity between them. And what uh, neural nets and, and connectionism has brought is the idea that concepts are uh, represented by patterns of activations. And this was inspired by what was thought of how things were done in the brain. So the concept for cat and the concept for dog would be close to each other in some space, which would be the pattern of activation of neurons. And they would be farther away from the concept 
uh, a person as represented by a vector corresponding to this, another pattern of activation. And, and these ideas were uh, brought by a, a large group of people, but the prominent among them was our, our colleague Jeff Hinton and, and David Hummelhart. So now let me try to explain why this idea of uh, distributed representation can be exponentially powerful. What, what, uh, to understand that, let's consider uh, not using distributed representation. Uh, a lot of uh, previous work in machine learning is addressing the problem of generalization by using only the idea of uh, smoothness or the idea that we can generalize locally by looking at uh, uh, nearby examples. For example, like in uh, K-nearest neighbors, where you take your input space and you break it in pieces and uh, you create those regions. In each of these regions, you're gonna have maybe one or more examples that tells you what the answer should be. Um, the problem is that the complexity of the function you can represent here is gonna grow linearly with the number of examples you have available to define the appropriate number of regions. With a neural net, what you can do is you can uh, create an exponential number of regions with uh, a linear number of parameters. And the way you do that is that each hidden neuron, say in a, in a simple neural net, breaks the input space into two parts with a linear classifier. And now you can have two to the n regions by, by con considering all of the configurations of those neurons. Um, what's interesting is that uh, when you look at the state-of-the-art uh, neural nets, for example, for vision, and you look at the high levels of representation, you actually find that the, these, these networks discover units that are meaningful uh, that humans would put a label on. So, uh, for example, this is uh, work from uh, uh, Turalbo's group where they, they found that the top level, level units in a network trying to recognize places were discovering uh, things like people, uh, tables, objects, things that were not, uh, they were not trained for. And, and why this is important? Because uh, it means that those networks are discovering features um, that, um, that, that are meaningful and that can, in a sense, be learned independently of each other. So you don't need to uh, consider all of the configurations, all the possible configurations of those features in order to learn. You imagine, for example, looking at images of people and you have a feature that tells the person wears a glass or not, another way that says the person is a female or not, another one that says the person is a child or an adult. Um, you can imagine uh, uh, collecting examples that tell you about each of these features without having to see all of the configurations of the other one. So you don't need an exponential number of, of features because each of these underlying features that are being discovered can somehow be uh, learned uh, almost by themselves. And so the number of parameters you actually need to learn all of these features grows linearly with the number of features. It doesn't grow exponentially as you would if you wanted to tile the space of all the configurations of these features. If you were to learn this with a classical non-parametric method, you would need to see examples for all of the configurations. Someone uh, wears or doesn't wear glasses, someone is a female or a male, someone is a child or not, and so on, right? And it would grow exponentially in the number of examples you would need. So this has been formalized in a number of papers, uh, for example, um, in uh, um, uh, last, uh, last year's uh, iClear, uh, we showed that a shallow neural network uh, uh, with uh, piecewise linear units can represent a number of regions that grow as n to the d, where d is the number of input dimensions and n is the number of hidden units. Another view of this is that uh, the difference between deep learning and earlier work is essentially the idea of composing features on top of features. So in, in classical rule-based systems, everything was programmed by hand. Uh, then uh, in classical machine learning, we have these hand-designed features and we learn how to uh, linearly compose these features to produce some outputs. Um, with classical neural nets, we uh, learn some new features on top of, the, uh, of these uh, handcrafted features, and then we learn a classifier on top. With deep learning, we just do more and more of these features on top of features. Um, so this idea of composing uh, sequentially uh, through depth is, uh, is something that brings you another exponential advantage. Uh, in the 90s, people thought that you don't need depth because a single hidden layer neural net is enough to represent anything efficiently. But what was found actually is that there are families of functions that can be represented very efficiently if you allow your, your circuit or your neural net to be deep enough, but would require an exponential number of units if you don't have enough depth. Of course, we don't know uh, if the function we actually want to learn are like these, but the, our, our experiments and, and, and the results suggest that um, the kind of functions we want to learn actually are like that. 
So um, it's, there's no free lunch here, right? Uh, deep learning is, is not a, a, a completely general purpose solution to everything. It just so happens that those priors, the depth and the distributed representations, and later we'll see with continents, uh, the, the priors that we put in these architectures work well for uh, the kind of data that we want to learn. Um, so this is something to, to keep in mind. Right? There's no magic. Um, in terms of theory, uh, we, sh we can also show exponential advantage from depth. So uh, I'm not going to go through that formula, but basically it says that, uh, again, if we have a, a deep network of uh, piecewise linear uh, units, the number of, of uh, piecewise uh, of, of linear pieces that it can uh, produce at the output uh, grows exponentially with the depth. So you get another exponential there. So now I'm going to uh, pass to uh, Jan. Thank you. So now we're going to talk about how to train those systems um, and talk about backprop in particular, which is the basis for most of what people do with deep learning nowadays, uh, at least the, the part that's practical. Um, so it used to be when people were talking about backprop, they're talking about neural nets and nodes and connections, but we don't, uh, we don't view the problem this way anymore. We talk about modules. So essentially when we build uh, uh, a neural net uh, these days, we have a library of modules that we can assemble, um, and the system automatically figures out um, how to compute the output from the input and how to compute gradients with respect to uh, all the parameters internal uh, to the system. So here's a, a little example of a very classical neural net, uh, one in which uh, the, first, the first layer is um, uh, essentially a, just a matrix. It takes the input vector, uh, multiplies by, by matrix, adds a, 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 a bias vector, and then the result is passed by a bunch of uh, nonlinearity. Basically, the, each component of the output vector is passed through nonlinearities. Those are the kind of the popular ones um, that a lot of people use these days, called ReLUs, rectified linear units, and they are basically half-wave rectifiers. So if the uh, if the input is positive, uh, you just copy the input on the output. If it's negative, you set it to zero. It's not exactly differentiable, but uh, but it's, it's close enough to to allow it to work. And then you stack another layer of linear transformation and nonlinear, uh, uh, pointwise nonlinear uh, uh, functions. So this, la this uh, network has three, has three layers of adaptive weights. Uh, and we're going to train it with square distance. So we're going to uh, train it to minimize the square of the error between the, the desired output vector and the output uh, it produces. We call those, we don't go, we're going to call this C. Um, it's kind of a cost. And so that's, again, a module, a cost module that um, uh, makes this measure on the several types that um, we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, so this is an example of a typical um, sort of deep learning framework, how you would define a network like this. And as you can tell, it's very, very simple. Uh, you create a, a, a network object, which basically is a container that is going to contain all those modules that they're going to be stacked on top of each other. And then you keep adding modules, a linear module, a threshold, which is a ReLU another linear a log softmax in this case, which uh, is used for classification. Um, and then you stick a, um, a, a cost function on top of it, and, and you can very easily compute the output by just sort of chaining the, the, the computation. Um, so now the question is, how do we train this? So we have to compute. Um, of course, we're going to train this with stochastic gradient descent. Stochastic gradient descent means that um, we are going to take one sample at a time and compute the gradient of our cost function for this particular sample, and then update our parameters. Uh, in modern times, because of the, because of the way GPUs are, are built, and uh, a lot of people use GPUs to train neural nets, it's more efficient to actually compute the gradient, uh, the average of the gradient over a small batch of samples. We call that a mini batch. Uh, but it's purely for uh, computation e efficiency. It's not for any kind of algorithmic reasons. Um, the, the optimal, if, if you have a, a fast machine, the optimal size for the mini batch is one. Okay, so how are we going to compute the gradient? We're going to base this on a chain rule. So it's, uh, I'm sure many of you have seen this before. Uh, so in the case of, uh, of those modules, if we have the gradient of our cost function with respect to the output of this particular module here inside of the network, so this is module number i, um, it produces output xi, and um, through the backpropagation algorithm, this module is being given the gradient of the cost function with respect to its output. And we don't need to know how that's done. We're just being given this, uh, this gradient. So this is going to be a vector of the same size as xi. OK, and this module knows how it's built. And so it knows how to, um, 
it knows its Jacobian matrix, or it knows its list of partial derivative of all of its inputs, all of its outputs with respect to all of its inputs, and all of its outputs with respect to all of its internal parameters, the weights, for example, that are used in the linear transform. And so by simply multiplying this gradient by the Jacobian of this box, which is the partial derivative of the output with respect to the input, or the partial derivative of this function f with respect to its first argument, then we can compute this, the gradient of the cost with respect to the input. And of course, that's a, uh, that's a recursive formula. We can apply this uh, all the way down until we have all the gradients with respect to all the outputs of all the, or all the inputs to all the, all the modules. And similarly, we can do the same with respect to the weights. There's another Jacobian matrix for this box, which is the list of partial derivatives of every output with respect to every parameter of that box. And so if we multiply this vector by this matrix, we get the, uh, the list of, of gradients here with respect to the weights. And that's what we're going to use to update the, um, update the parameters. It's the wrong button. So, um, um, so this is, again, an example of how you run backprop. Um, so there is a trick that a lot of those frameworks use, which is that you, you pull out all the parameters in a single vector so that from the point of view of the optimization algorithm, it looks like just a function with a big vector. It doesn't need to know about the structure of the network. That's rather important. Um, and the, back, the backprop is just you know, a simple call, essentially. So what we're going to do is build those networks out of basic modules. And there are a few that are important that, that we, uh, we use all the time. So the linear I already mentioned. Um, just multiply a vector by a matrix. Uh, the backprop is very simple. You multiply the gradient by the transpose of the matrix. So it's simple derivatives. The ReLU we've talked about already. Uh, there are modules that can duplicate their output. And they, the gradients need to be summed up when you uh, go backwards. You can add vectors. You can compute the max of two values. You can compute complicated functions of them. And for all of those, we have uh, mo predefined modules that already compute uh, uh, output from input and gradient with respect to input with respect to uh, from the gradient respect to outputs. There's a long laundry list of those, and most of the deep learning frameworks have, um, have most of those uh, uh, implemented. Now, what I talked about here is the situation where the modules are one after the other in a cascade, uh, kind of a sequential type structure. But in fact, um, you can express this for any kind of um, directed acyclic graph, any, uh, any DAG. You can arrange the module in any kind of uh, 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 configuration, as long as there is no loop in your graph, uh, the uh, algorithms will figure out how to propagate the gradients appropriately. Um, and there is a number of frameworks that are very popular for doing this. Uh, Theano has built in um, uh, automatic differentiation, which allows you to actually write programs, not just assemble boxes, but actually write just uh, programs that will kind of figure out how to compute the gradients automatically. Torch 7 also has a package called Autograd, which does that, uh, produced by Twitter. Um, and uh, uh, TensorFlow is coming as well on the way. Um, so in practice, um, we use ReLU for nonlinearities because that works well when we have many, many layers. We use cross-entropy loss for classification uh, uh, very often. Uh, we use stochastic gradients for mini batches, as I mentioned. Uh, you need to shuffle all the samples, otherwise stochastic gradient doesn't work. You need to normalize the input variables, uh, cancel the mean, uh, uh, and maybe normalize the variance. Uh, that accelerates learning. Uh, you need to have a schedule to decrease the learning rate to get convergence. And there's you know, a bunch of other tricks that I'll talk about later. Um, and there's a long list of those uh, in various papers that have been published over the last few decades. OK, the next uh, topic is, uh, is uh, convolutional nets. So convolutional nets are a particular architecture, a deep learning architecture, that is very popular for uh, image recognition, but also for other types of data where the data comes to you in the form of an array, and in such a way that uh, local variables are highly correlated within the array, and, uh, and distinctive features can appear anywhere in the array. So it's typical for an image. Uh, features that are useful to detect at one part of the image are probably also useful to detect in another part of the image. And there is some sort of shifting variance in the sense that the nature of an object uh, doesn't change if you shift this object a little bit. So that's uh, the motivation for neural nets. And um, the, the, what, what it allowed us to do is, um, um, when we first played with this, was to, again, use this idea of stacking multiple layers and learn all the feature uh, hierarchy from, from end to end. So a convolutional net is actually a stack of a particular sequence of, uh, of modules. Uh, so each of those is a stage. 
and a stage is composed of an optional normalization, a filter bank, so these are conventional filters, uh, a pointwise nonlinearity, and then uh, feature pooling, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain this uh, in a minute. And then we take this entire stage and we repeat it multiple times, uh, optionally dropping the pooling or the normalization. Not the nonlinearity though, you need this at every layer. Um, here's a particular example. This is a vintage uh, convolutional net from the early 90s, in fact, late 80s even. Uh, it was published at NIPS. <clears throat> and um, the, the, the input here is an image. The first layer is composed of a bunch of planes, uh, which are called feature maps. Each of those planes is a feature map. And the way you compute one of the feature maps is you take a small uh, convolution kernel, so it's just a, an array of, of coefficients. You apply those coefficients to a particular location on the image. You compute the dot product between those coefficients and the corresponding input, and you write this in the output. And then you take those, this array of coefficients and you swipe it over the entire image, and that produces the results uh, here in one feature map. Each feature map here is going to use a different set of, uh, of coefficients, a different filter, if you want. Um, so collectively, they, uh, they constitute a filter bank. And then the next operation is pooling and subsampling. Um, so in fact, I, this is meant to be an animation, but uh, it's not running, so I encourage you to go to this. Uh, Andre Caprati did this pretty cute thing. Um, here's another animation. So this is um, a convolutional net in action. Uh, it's got uh, the input here, first layer, uh, first layer after pooling, um, second stage, and then after pooling, and then third stage. Uh, then there is an output that you don't see. And so the role of the, the pooling layer each unit in the pooling layer, each pixel here is the output of one unit, and it, it computes a, uh, an aggregation of the outputs of a neighborhood on the previous layer. So in this case, it's a two by two neighborhood, and this computes the average of those, those, uh, those values and then passes that to a nonlinearity. Uh, in more modern versions of convolutional net, uh, we do max pooling. So we can just take the max of the value within a small, a small region. And what happens is that those values, the, those neighborhoods are shifted by more than one pixel and therefore, this map has lower resolution than what we started with. In this case here, it's half the resolution. At the second stage, um, each pixel here is the result of applying a different filter to each of those maps and then adding up the results and then passing that through a nonlinearity. So what this guy does is that it computes uh, conjunctions of features from the previous layer, then passes it through a nonlinearity. And then we have another layer of pooling and subsampling. So as we go up the layers, the res spatial resolution goes down and the number of features generally goes up, um, and we get some sort of distributed representation of the content of the image that's relatively invariant to small shifts because of the pooling. Um, so you can apply those convolutions to 2D arrays uh, in the case of images, to 1D array in the case of signals, temporal signals, for example, or 3D arrays in the case of volumetric images, like medical images and things of that type. Again, to define a convolutional net is very simple. It's just a, a, few, a few lines of command in any uh, deep learning framework that you want to use. Um, and um, there's, there's nothing really complicated about it. Okay, one important aspect of uh, convnets is that you can replicate them over uh, a large field very efficiently in the sense that if you have a single convolutional net here that produces a single output and you back project, um, you know, what it, its influence on an input here is a particular size, but if you want to apply this convolutional net with a sliding window over a larger input, it's very easy. You just uh, apply the convolutions to the larger image. It's gonna produce larger outputs and then the, uh, if you view the output it itself as a convolution, it will, it's gonna be replicated as well. And what you're gonna get is uh, an output for every possible location on the input. This is extremely useful because that allows us to use convolutional nets to do detection, to do multiple object recognition, and it alleviates the need to do explicit, explicit segmentation of objects in the image. So this is an example of that. Uh, again, this is a, a relatively uh, old uh, animation from the mid 90s. Uh, where we have here a convolutional net applied with a, uh, a sliding window over the input, and it's very efficient to do this. It's very, very simple. So each location produces a score for, for uh, each category, and then there is a very simple post-processing that pulls out the best interpretation. Um, so here, several detectors detects the five and the three, and there is no need for explicit segmentation or for separating the characters from its neighbors or anything like that. Um, so, um, the idea of hierarchy, as Joshua was, was talking about, uh, is very important. Um, one of the reasons why uh, convolutional nets work so well is that the natural data, natural signals, are compositional. Um, 
in a sense that uh, complex objects are formed by a relatively small number of different simpler objects, etc. And that's what allows us to build those hierarchies of features. Uh, there's a little bit of inspiration of convolutional nets from the visual cortex uh, in, in mammals. It's a very sort of tenuous inspiration, but the inspiration is there. That's, that's, where, that's the history of it, that's where it came from, uh, from classic work in neuroscience. Um, so there's a lot of applications of convolutional nets, a lot of which have been, uh, are, have been deployed. I'll talk about this more later. But um, 1D convolutional nets can be applied to text, to uh, music, to speech, uh, time series prediction, 2D conv nets to uh, images, of course, and 3D conv nets to video, biomedical image analysis, hyperspectral image analysis, etc. And I'll hand it back over to Joshua to talk about recurrent nets. Thanks. So in the case of convolutional nets, we used uh, an assumption that the same feature is useful at different positions in space or in time in the case of a sequence. Uh, in the case of recurrent nets, we're gonna use the same kind of assumption, but we're gonna be thinking about a dynamical system that uh, evolves through time, except that it uses the same parameters at different time steps. This is, of course, a, a common thing in many uh, uh, cases when you design dynamical systems. But here, the difference is we're gonna be learning the dynamical system. So what is shown here is a sequence of inputs, xt minus one, xt, xt plus one, and a sequence of states. So the s here is supposed to represent a kind of summary of everything you've seen before. It depends on the previous state and the, and the current input. And in a sense, it's a function of all of the previous inputs, but that function is complicated. It's the you know, composition of all the previous applications of the function f here that has our parameters. Um, and so with a small number of parameters, we can actually compute a function over a very long sequence. So that's the, the, the basic building block of uh, recurrent nets. What we're gonna be doing with them is usually things like predicting something, like predicting some outputs. So we add some ingredients in the architecture. Um, what, what we've seen in this picture is uh, the idea of unfolding. So we have a little diagram of uh, a neuron or a group of neurons that are connected to themselves and also receive input from X. Uh, and what we do is we consider the, the sequence of, of time steps as different instances of the, those neurons or those, those uh, activations. And we can do the same thing here, but we've added outputs and extra parameters. Uh, to connect the, uh, the, the states to the outputs in addition to uh, connecting states to the next state and inputs to states. Um, one of the most common uses of uh, recurrent nets is uh, in a kind of generative mode where the outputs you're producing also become extra inputs for the next time step. So uh, here we can think of them as directed graphical models. They can be used to represent the joints probability over a sequence of, of things. Here is a sequence of x's. And uh, we just exploit the fact that uh, the joint can be written as the product of conditionals of the form p of the next element given all the previous ones. And now the given all the previous ones is going to be summarized by our recurrent net. So the recurrent net at each time step uh, is going to produce a probability distribution over the next symbol. Then if we want to actually use the neural net to generate a new sequence, we're gonna sample from that distribution. We're gonna get a new symbol and we're gonna use it as input for the next time step. Um, when we train, we know the sequence and so we can compute the probability of observing the correct, correct symbol given all the previous symbols. And we can multiply these probabilities or add the corresponding log probabilities and that's the thing we want to maximize. All right, um, now there's a little problem with this which is called teacher forcing which is that at training time, we're using the uh, training sequence to force the outputs to take the value uh, that's observed in the data, and we use those, uh, uh, those uh, observed sequences as inputs. But when we are gonna be using the, the neural net to generate sequences, it might not generate sequences that are exactly like those in the training set, and we, actually we want that because we want to generalize. Uh, and so it, it might now see uh, inputs that are going to be different from what it has seen during training. So this is a, there is some work trying to, to deal with this, but that's one of potential issues uh, with the uh, maximum likelihood way of training recurrent nets. Now, the architectures I showed you up to now were fairly simple, but you can make them more complex. Uh, so these, these are the, on the uh, top left, uh, sort of uh, vanilla recurrent nets, but you can make them deeper by stacking different layers. You can, you can make them deeper by inserting more nonlinearities and more layers from t to t plus one, or between the uh, states and the outputs, or between the inputs and the states. 
Now there is a um, uh, very important uh, issue to keep in mind when we study recurrent nets and try to use them is the issue of long-term dependencies and gradient vanishing or gradient explosion. And it arises because we have this uh, deep composition, right? A neural net is like a very, very deep network with shared parameters. Uh, the state at time t uh, is, is obtained from the state at time t minus 1 and, and, and so on. The final loss is a composition of many applications of our dynamical system. So when we compute derivatives using the chain rule, using the ideas uh, that Jan told you about earlier, uh, we see that the, the, the gradient of the loss with respect to some state, which tells us how we should change the state to minimize our loss, is, uh, is going to be a product of many Jacobian matrices of dst, dst minus 1. Um, the problem is when you multiply a, a, a many things together, they tend to either uh, explode to infinity as we uh, uh, multiply more and more things, or to vanish towards zero. Or in general, their variance is going to grow exponentially, which is just you know, basically saying you're either going to vanish or explode. Um, so that's, um, that's bad because if the gradients are very large, uh, gradient descent, uh, gradient-based methods are not going to work well. And if they vanish, they're not going to work well either. Um, the thing that I showed in, in a paper in, in 94 is that the, in order for a neural net or recurrent net to store bits of information reliably, uh, you actually need to be in the regime where uh, the, uh, the, 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 the gradients are vanishing. And that corresponds to singular values of the Jacobian matrices being less than one. So in other words, to have stable storage of information, you're going to be in a situation where the gradients become very, very small when you look at very long-term dependencies. So what's going to happen is that it's going to be the short-term dependencies that will dominate in the total gradient, which is going to be the sum over all the, the, the time durations. And that makes it harder to learn the long-term dependencies. Now, regarding the uh, large uh, gradients, when that happens, there's a very simple trick called uh, clipping, which, uh, and there are different versions of it, but the, the, the one that we've been using mostly is, if the, the norm of the gradient is above a threshold, then you, you make, it, make its norm equal to the threshold. Um, there are a number of other tricks uh, that people have proposed to help training neural nets. Um, uh, such as, uh, you know, initialization can be important, uh, like in many other neural nets, by the way, but it's, this is especially the case here. Uh, for example, uh, if, you, if you initialize your weights to be in a, recurrent weights to be roughly orthogonal or something like that, that, se that seems to help. Um, another, um, another thing that uh, has been really, really popular is the special architecture called uh, LSTM for long short-term memory. Uh, and other similar architectures that introduce a kind of uh, uh, self-loop with uh, a weight that's going to be less than one uh, in the architecture. So this, this, is, this is the architecture for one unit that replaces the normal uh, uh, neural net unit. And what it does is that it, it allows uh, some paths, when you unfold the computation, uh, to have gradients propagate easily through the self-loop that's close to one. Um, so this, this, has, this actually makes a big difference. And as I said, there are uh, variants of this idea, like the GRU, uh, gated recurrent unit. But the idea is always the same, that we create paths in the propagation and, and also, uh, conversely, in the backward propagation that allow information to essentially be copied or go unhampered. And so gradients can and propagate over longer durations. There are other tricks that people have used uh, such as introducing delays between different time steps. Uh, and that allows to sort of skip uh, and, and consider uh, uh, longer term dependencies. Another general idea that was introduced uh, about 20 years ago uh, at, at NIPS, actually, uh, is the idea of introducing multiple time scales. Uh, so again, that's another trick that people are exploring. But uh, I would say that this is still, still an open problem how to do that properly. So let me move to back-to-back uh, -back prop. Okay. All right, so let's talk about a, uh, a few tricks uh, to make backprop work. I mentioned a few already, but um, uh, there are more. Okay, so first we have to understand a little bit how gradient descent works. Uh, gradient descent, um, uh, batch gradient descent in this case, of course, uh, depends on the step size, and uh, a lot of people spend a lot of time trying to figure out what to set the step size to. 
So in one dimension, it's very easy to analyze what the optimal step size is. Uh, basically, if you set the step size to the inverse of the curvature of the second derivative of your function in 1D, you're going to jump. And if, if this uh, function is quadratic, you're going to jump to the minimum in one step. The problem is that, of course, in multiple dimensions, uh, things are not quite uh, that easy. Um, so let's take the example of a very simple uh, uh, single unit uh, uh, with two inputs. And we're going to train it to uh, essentially classify those, those, those two sets of samples. Uh, we wanted to produce minus one for those samples, plus one for, that, for those samples uh, with a quadratic loss. So it's a very simple, uh, essentially, uh, linear regression. And of course, uh, as many of you uh, sure know, the uh, Hessian matrix for this is uh, the outer product of the uh, uh, input vectors, the, the covariance matrix of the input vectors. And the curvatures in different dimensions are determined by the eigen, eigenvalues of this, uh, of this matrix. So if you take um, a particular case, for example, uh, so for the data set I just showed, if you uh, plot the, the contours of the cost function, it looks a little elongated like this. So there is a direction in which the curvature is high and a direction in which the curvature is low. And if you use batch gradient, so each uh, passage, each pass through the training set, each epoch, is uh, represented by a color here in the trajectory. So we compute the gradient over the entire training set, make a step. So this is not stochastic gradient, it's batch gradient. And then compute the gradient again, make a step, et cetera. This is a pretty good value for a learning rate here, but it's going to take a very long time to converge because, uh, because of the sort of difference between those two eigenvalues. If we set the learning rate too large, then one dimension starts diverging, maybe the other one keeps, uh, keeps converging. Now imagine this in 100 million dimension, a typical size of a convolutional net, for example, for image recognition, typically would have on the order of 100 million uh, 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 parameters. So of course, uh, as I said before, we use uh, stochastic gradient. And to stochastic, the, the trajectory of stochastic gradient is represented here. And what happens here is that, of course, there is a lot of fluctuation uh, because the gradient is very noisy. And so if we want the, um, this path to converge uh, to the right place on average as fast as possible, we're going to have some sort of, uh, you know, some, some amount of fluctuation. And so if we really want the algorithm to converge, we need to decrease the learning rate to kind of let it uh, fall down the bottom. In practice, uh, we do this, or we use a technique called um, uh, average uh, gradient. Uh, we also combine this with something called Nesterov momentum, uh, which is uh, a way of kind of smoothing this trajectory a little bit and making it go faster in the directions where the curvature is low. Uh, but that kind of shows the, the, the speed advantage of stochastic gradient, even in, in this very, very simple example uh, over batch gradient. OK, now, if we, this is the simple case of a single unit with two inputs. Now, let's talk about the simplest possible multilayer network that we can think of. And this is uh, a two-layer net. It has one input, one hidden unit, one output. It's got two weights. And what it's trying to do is um, just copy its input on its output with a square loss. Okay? So this is the loss function. Uh, we want to put one on the input, and we want one on the output. And the loss function looks like this. If you plot it in 3D, it's this kind of funny shape thing here where the solution space, of course, is a hyperbola because we just need to set uh, one, of, one weight to the inverse of the other weight for this whole thing to go to zero. And so you get a hyperbola in the solution, and there is a, a saddle point in the center. This is a slightly different network where we put a sigmoid in the middle, and here uh, um, it's a contour plot again. There's a saddle point right there, and there are kind of banana-shaped solutions here uh, on each side. So the first thing you, you notice is that the two solutions are essentially equivalent. Yes, there are local minima, but it doesn't matter which one you pick. And that's a very important point. Uh, we're going to come back to that. The second thing you notice is that um, depending on where you start, you're going to spend a lot of time trying to figure out in which of the two minima to go to uh, because you're next to this, uh, this saddle point, which is very flat. And remember that again, because that's basically what slows down. That's what limits the speed at which we can train on neural nets. So one is ill conditioning, which I talked about earlier, uh, when we're near minimum. The second one is uh, bouncing from, local, from uh, saddle point to saddle point. Um, and there is one problem that we thought was one back in the uh, 80s and 90s, which turned out not to be a problem, is the local minima problem. It turns out not to be a problem. And I'm going to say a few words about this as well. Um, so in fact, um, you can represent the function uh, computed by uh, an, uh, a deep neural net with values. Uh, once a path, all the units along a path are in the linear region of the ReLU, then the, the contribution of that path to the output is simply the product of the input by all the weights along the path. It's linear. 
Okay? And in fact, the input-output relationship is simply the sum of the contributions of all the paths. So it's like a, a path integral for those of you who know what that is. And um, I mean, it's discrete integral, of course. And it turns out uh, when we kind of express this in, such, in, in that way, the, the loss function can be represented as uh, a polynomial on the sphere because it doesn't matter what uh, size we give to those weights. Uh, and there's a lot of is known about the properties of such polynomials when the coefficients are, are random and they come from a Gaussian distribution, which is not the case here, but they are random. Um, so there are results from random matrix theory that tell us that, yes, those functions have a ridiculously large number of saddle points. They have a ridiculously large number of local minima, but almost all of the local minima are equivalent. So it doesn't matter which one you find. You're always going to get the same result. And it was a bit of a mystery for a couple of decades as to whether large neural nets would always converge to almost the same solution, despite the fact that the loss function was very, very highly non-convex with lots of local minima. And uh, it's only in the last few years that we kind of have you know, some results, at least, that show uh, from Joshua, Joshua's lab, my lab, and, and a couple others that, that show that um, local minima problem is actually not a problem. Um, so that's, um, you, you have a few references here for, for those uh, work. These are very recent work, um, um, where we try to analyze the, the behavior of, of the convergence, the, the question of where, you know, whether saddle points are, are the problem and, and, and whether local minima are the problem. So it's, it's confusing because we have this representation of local minima in low dimension where, uh, you know, in two dimensions, it's very easy to make a box. In three dimensions, it's relatively easy to make a box. In 100 million dimensions, you cannot make a box. You need too many walls. And so local minima just don't appear in that many dimensions with the kind of elements that we use for, uh, for neural nets. But we do have lots of saddle points. So this is an experiment that was done in uh, Yoshua's lab uh, that shows that um, the, um, this is the error. And there is this behavior that the error kind of goes down relatively slowly. The gradient is pretty high. This is the, the norm of the gradient. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, the error goes down. And then it gets stable again. While it's stable, the gradient is low. And then all of a sudden, it finds it goes down pretty quickly. And the gradient goes up all of a sudden. And so you have this succession of plateaus where the gradient is low. And then it accelerates. And that's an indication that the system is basically bouncing from saddle point to saddle point. And you know, getting near a saddle point and trying to figure out which way to go. And then once it finds a path, the gradient gets larger and the error goes down. Um, this is a uh, plot that was done by uh, my postdoc, uh, Anna Koromanska, with two of my students, um, uh, Michael Enaf and Michael Mathieu, that shows the distribution of local minima. So this is a pretty sort of extensive experiment where we um, sort of um, you know, run, try to find all the, all the minima of a relatively large neural net. It's not that large, but relatively large. And what you notice is that they are all very, very clustered in terms of the loss value. So these are all the minima that are found by backprop, stochastic gradient descent. And they're all clustered around a very narrow band of energies, which means, again, it's an experimental confirmation that you know, local minima are pretty much all equivalent. You're going to find one of those. Um, so a few more tricks. Um, um, uh, piecewise nonlinearity. There was uh, interesting work in uh, Yosha's lab and in my lab also on the, the role of the nonlinearity. And uh, uh, we used to use hyperbolic tangent and sigmoid functions. And we discovered relatively recently that if you use those values or uh, rectification, things work a lot better. You can stack many more layers and things still converge. Uh, it's surprising that it took us so long to figure this out. Um, uh, there is a trick that everybody uses called dropout. And this is the idea of essentially uh, suppressing a subset of units in a layer, um, a random subset at every sample. So you show a sample to the system, and you do the computation as if half of the units, a random subset of half of the units in a particular layer didn't exist. Um, and this drives the, the features to be relatively independent with each other, of each other and to not actually kind of learn some sort of conspiracy theory of why the, the function should be what it is. Uh, so this is called dropout. And there are some uh, interesting uh, theoretical justification for it. It's basically kind of a cheap way of simulating an ensemble of a large number of networks with all kinds of different subsets of those units turned on. And it has a very sort of, it's very brutal, kind of murderous, genocidal 
regular, you know, regular, regularization effect, but, um, but it works pretty well on very large networks. Basically, what we've discovered is that the mistake we were making 25 years ago is that our networks were much too small. If we make them very large and we regularize the head out of them, it works. Uh, batch normalization is a, another important trick. Uh, this relates to some of the problems of conditioning that I was talking about earlier. It's basically the idea of normalizing the activities in a layer um, by uh, dividing by some sort of standard deviation of all the outputs within the mini-batch. But you, uh, for this to work, you actually have to backpropagate through the circuit that actually does normalization. Uh, that's built into a lot of uh, uh, systems, um, you know, sort of deep learning frameworks. Um, and what people have been doing over the last few years also is um, uh, using large uh, arrays of GPUs to explore the hyperparameter space in a relatively systematic way. So if you don't know how many layers to give to your network, how many units in each layer, what size kernel in the convolutional net, or, or you know, what learning rate to use, what uh, regularization coefficients to use, uh, you do kind of a, a search over the set of hyperparameters. And some of the techniques that work best actually do random search. So you pick a random combination of those things, and you kind of um, uh, you know, hone in on the, on the, on the solution. There's slightly more sophisticated techniques that occasionally give better results, but not always, that tend to use things like uh, 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 Gaussian processes to approximate the, the surface of uh, performance of the system and kind of test uh, things that have a high probability of getting better. Um, and then the last thing I, uh, I want to uh, mention is the uh, idea of distributed training. So um, uh, in distributed training, uh, 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 well, for training very large neural nets on large data sets, we need to be able to distribute the computation over multiple, uh, over multiple um, uh, uh, CPUs or GPUs, multiple machines. And there are several methods for doing this. Uh, some, use, some just do data parallelism, so distribute the, the mini batch over multiple machines, but then you have to add up the gradients, and that requires a lot of communication. Uh, another uh, uh, trick is uh, asynchronous HDD, where uh, which uh, actually Joshua pioneered a long time ago, where you know each worker computes its gradient and whenever it has time sends uh, its new parameter or its gradients to uh, kind of a central parameter server. Uh, there's new methods. Uh, one is actually published uh, here, uh, coming out of my lab, called Elastic Average HDD, and this is a, a method that uh, has a bunch of workers kind of linked with elastic uh, penalties, if you want, so that they all tend to converge to the same solution. Okay. Before we switch, I would like to add a little thing here um, about saddle points. So, uh, it's a saddle point has uh, directions going up and uh, directions going down. And in low dimension, it's easy to find all the dimensions going up, so you find a lot of local minima. But in high dimensions, in order to get a local minimum, you, you need to have all of the dimensions going up, right? So what are the chances of that happening with some kind of random function? So that's what the, some of the theoretical results behind, these resu uh, behind this work say that essentially this is going to happen very, very rarely. And the only time you're going to have local minima is when your local minimum is already so low, it's already a good minimum. In other words, you can't go lower. And so in that case, you're going you're gonna to have a local minimum. And the probability of finding these local minima that are bad is going to be exponentially small, essentially. All right. OK, now we're going to talk a little bit about uh, applications to computer vision. So. Um, one of the applications of deep learning that has really taken off, uh, it was kind of the second one to really take off, is the application to computer vision. The first one was for speech recognition. Um, and around 2012, uh, after many years, if not a decade, of uh, uh, deep learning being sort of under the radar in the computer vision community, it started be becoming very popular, so popular, in fact, that it completely took over in the space of, of a year, essentially. Uh, so before 2013, Almost nobody in computer vision was using commercial nets. Uh, by 2014, everybody was using commercial nets. In 2011, you could not, not get a paper accepted at a, conference, a computer vision conference that used uh, commercial nets. In 2015, you cannot get a paper accepted if you don't use commercial nets. Oops. 
Um, so to tell you, uh, to give you an idea of the scale of uh, the success here, uh, almost all modern image understanding systems use convolutional nets. They're all they're used by all industries. Uh, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, IBM, Baidu, Yahoo, Flickr, Adobe, Yandex, uh, WeChat, I mean the company that owns WeChat, NEC, NVIDIA, Mobileye, Qualcomm, everybody uses deep learning and everybody uses convolutional nets for, for vision applications. Um, um, for uh, Facebook alone, uh, people upload about 700 million photos on Facebook every day. This is just Facebook.com, doesn't count uh, WhatsApp and Instagram. Um, and uh, every single one of those goes through two convolutional nets. Uh, one that does object recognition, the other one does face recognition. Actually, that's a lie. Uh, the face recognition is not turned on in certain countries, in Europe, for example. Um, but it's, it's very, very heavily used, uh, and there are kind of similar scale um, of usage at uh, other companies. Um, if you uh, are, are uh, lucky enough to own a Tesla, uh, a recent Tesla, the autopilot that keeps you in lane and measures the distance to the car in front is a convolutional net. A number of uh, uh, hardware companies are building chips for that. So I told you about the, uh, one of the big applications of, uh, of convolutional net or advantages is the fact that you can swipe it over a large image. And uh, we discovered that pretty, uh, pretty long ago that we could take a convolutional net, swipe it over an image, and use it as, for example, a face detector. Um, first systems of those type were, were built in the, in the early 90s, 1993, 1994. Uh, you can also apply this, of course, to pedestrian detection. So this is a, a pedestrian detector, uh, runs convolutionally over the entire image. And um, so basically, the output of this convolutional net is a heat map, which uh, it's applied at multiple scales. Okay, so you take the image, you uh, build a pyramid of, of images of lower and lower resolution, and you apply the convolutional net to all the scales, and you get a heat map uh, for each scale and each location. You get a score as to whether there is a pedestrian in that location, uh, and um, and then you do a little bit of post-processing, non-maximum suppression, and you draw a box that corresponds to the uh, where you think it was. Um, so this was done by Pierre Samanet when he was a student in my lab. He's now Google. Uh, this is a, uh, a relatively old video from 2007 by uh, my friend Sebastian Song uh, and his uh, former students, uh, Vian Jain and Srini Turaga. And they were interested in reconstructing a neural circuit using, connect uh, so this is the connectomics problem. So you have this very, very high resolution, five nanometer resolution image of a piece of a brain tissue. And you train a convolutional net to classify the central voxel of a, a small volume as to whether it's the, the membrane of a, of a, of a neuron or the inside or outside. And then you can run segmentation algorithms to figure out where all the neurons are. Here, they show only about 2% of the neurons. If you show them all, it's densely packed and you, you wouldn't see anything. Um, in the last uh, eight years, they've refined this technique a lot and um, uh, they are now kind of you know, doing a lot of uh, uh, processing of uh, brain tissue with this and they made new discoveries of how the retina works, for example, using this kind of technique. Um, so a similar technique applied to images, uh, to 2D images, is the, what's called the scene parsing or, se or semantic labeling problem, which consists in figuring out the category of uh, the, the, each pixel being given the category of the object it belongs to. So every pixel here is, is the sky. Uh, these are buildings and, uh, you know, things are trees, there are no trees, but, um, you know, plant and road and car and door and window, etc. So this is, in a sense, kind of the ultimate vision task. If you are able to do this accurately for every uh, pixel with a lot of categories, you've basically solved uh, most of the vision problems. So the way to do this is to, again, use a, a multi-scale uh, method where you take uh, 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 one image, and this is the kind of the back projection of the zone of influence, the receptive field of a particular output uh, vector here. So an output vector at a particular location, when you trace back how it's influenced, it's a 46 by 46 window. And it's very difficult to make a decision for, say, a gray pixel by just looking at a 46 by 46 window. You have to look at the entire thing to really tell what this pixel is. And so we feed the same image at, at lower resolution to the same convolutional net um, and uh, you know, concatenate the features uh, so as to kind of do this semantic segmentation. And now this decision is made on the basis of a very large uh, context around the pixel you're trying to, uh, uh, to classify. And this works really well. Uh, let me show you a video of this, if I may. Right, so this is a system that was built about five or six years ago. Uh, it was eventually implemented on the FPGA, and it could run in, in you know, roughly real time. Um, 
it's not perfect, very far from it, but uh, more modern techniques with uh, uh, transfer learning actually would work a lot better than this. Uh, people are working on this at the moment. And these are uh, the, the people in the car industry who are working on self-driving cars are basically using techniques like this to label the uh, full image and figure out where obstacles are and where to drive. Uh, before A few years before that, uh, the reason we thought this could work is because we'd worked on a very interesting pro program uh, funded by DARPA called Lager, which uh, consisted in driving those little robots around uh, out in nature. Um, uh, this program was um, um, actually designed by uh, a DARPA program manager who is sitting right here, Larry Jackal. Um, and uh, the system was doing also semantic segmentation by labeling every pixel in the image as to whether you can drive over it or not. Uh, using a convolutional net again uh, that would look at sort of bands around the horizon and then uh, kind of classify every pixel. So it was trained in the lab, but uh, there was this interesting characteristic that the system could also uh, be trained on the fly as the robot runs. So while the robot is running, uh, it gets information as to whether something sticks out of the ground from stereo vision. If an object is near, uh, near enough, stereo vision can tell you if this object sticks out of the ground. And so immediately you get a label to tell the the convolutional net, uh, this is an obstacle, sort of adapt yourself so that uh, you won't run into it next time. Okay, in 2012, two things happened. First, uh, a large data set uh, appeared for object recognition called ImageNet. It was put together by uh, Fefeli, Alex Berg, and a bunch of other people. And it had 1.2 million training samples, 1,000 categories. And it turns out that's enough to train a very large neural net and do something sensible. Simultaneously, um, it, was, it was possible to get our hands on uh, fast graphical processing units that were capable of about a trillion operations per second uh, from, from, from NVIDIA. And uh, Alex Krzyzewski, Ilya Suskever, and Jeff Hinton um, uh, were the first to basically have a very efficient implementation of convolutional nets on those GPUs and were able to train on this large data set. At the time, it was taking about a month to train. Now, we can do this in a few hours, but... Um, um, those are very large networks with uh, on the order of a billion uh, connections, on the order of a few hundred million um, free parameters. And the interesting thing is that the, the year they entered the competition, they were way ahead of the competition. These are alternate techniques that are not using deep learning. And they beat them by a big, a big margin, which uh, convinced the, most of the uh, vision community to switch to using commercial nets. So the next year, almost everybody was using commercial nets. And after that, uh, it was over. And every time the performance goes, uh, uh, the error rate goes down. Uh, I think the best record now is around four, uh, less than 4%, I think. So it's very interesting to see what those filters look like once the system trends. So this is a learning algorithm actually taking place. So we start from random initial conditions. And as the learning proceeds, they start kind of specializing and, and learn oriented uh, filters. And those are things you would expect the system to learn. And it's pretty uh, interesting to see that they learn it. Um, now, since then, people have made progress. So the, the, the performance that I showed you, um, the best performing architectures nowadays are of two kinds. Uh, one is uh, called VGG. It comes from the, the visual geometry group at Oxford. And uh, it's a very, very deep network where the, the convolution kernels are very narrow, three by three, but so that you can stack a whole bunch of them. And the more layers of nonlinearities you have, the better it works, it seems. And so Google had the idea of uh, this so-called inception architecture, where you can have modules that repeat uh, itself and, uh, and sort of reduces the, the, uh, the, uh, the dimension at every time of the features. They call that uh, Google Net. So this is kind of a play on word on my old network that was called Lenet. Um, uh, this is another, the results from another network that uh, was trained again by my, uh, my uh, student Pierre Somane, uh, a system called Overfeed that does simultaneous um, recognition, localization, and detection. And uh, the more modern systems that people have built, uh, for example, the system built by Ross Gershik more recently is, um, um, is you know, much higher performance than, than this system from four, three years ago. Um, but even three years ago, we were able to you know, tell apart uh, two birds uh, from each other, detect burritos, works very well for burritos, um, horns of various kinds, distinguish sheep from white dogs, uh, find people, uh, find multiple dogs, more horns, etc. More recently, there's some work uh, out of Facebook AI Research on uh, not only recognizing objects, but also drawing the outline of this object. So this is sort of a little bit like semantic segmentation, but the number of categories here is much larger than what we used to do uh, in that context. This is work by uh, 
for Uncle Robert Pierre Dollar uh, with a student. Uh, um, which was published at um, uh, CVPR, I believe, last year. OK, one of the biggest applications of computer vision these days is, um, is face recognition. And face recognition, the problem is, at training time, you don't know all the categories. Uh, you're not being told all the categories at training time. You, you, you can train a system with you know, maybe a million uh, different faces, but eventually, you'll have to recognize way more faces than that. Um, so how do you do that? Uh, what you do is use a, a trick which is extremely popular for other applications as well, for embedding just about anything called metric learning. So you show two images of the same person, you run them both through the same uh, convolutional net, and you, you, you take the last feature layer and you tell the system, I want those two, uh, those two vectors to be as close to each other as possible. Okay, and then you take two images from different people, you run them through the convolutional net again, and then you tell the system, I want those two vectors to be far apart by at least some distance. The margin, let's say, and you keep doing this by, you know, carefully selecting the, the, uh, the, the contrary examples, and, and eventually the system kind of learns to map uh, uh, objects, faces in this case, in a in a lower dimensional space where basically distance, Euclidean distance, means uh, identity. So people, uh, over the last three years, there's been an explosion of applications of convolutional net to all kinds of different things, where people have been able to do things like reconstruct the 3D. Uh, a configuration of a hand, uh, figure out key points on people, uh, uh, um, I'm not going to go into the details, but reconstruct the, the pose of uh, uh, human bodies uh, using a combination of convolutional net with graphical models that are trained in the loop. So you can stick a graphical model on top of a convolutional net and then train the whole thing at once. And again, I'm not going to explain how this is done, but, uh, um, uh, but just want to tell you it exists. And uh, the more stunning applications of the last few months are things like uh, image captioning, where uh, systems are able to just look at an image and basically produce a description of it. And it's actually not as impressive as it looks, uh, in the sense that the perplexity on the text that, uh, of a typical task of this type is not very high. Um, then, of course, you can apply this uh, uh, 3D, you can apply 3D convolutional nets for video classification. Uh, this is uh, some work that was done at Facebook Air Research. Um, and uh, uh, trained on, on you know, sports classification. This is a data set that was put together by Google, which has one million videos of various sports. It's a pretty good job at uh, classifying those sports, but those are easy because they're all very different. And so here's a little more complicated because they're not that, dif uh, that different. They're all kind of gliding, if you want. Um, Lastly, I just want to mention very quickly that there are applications of convolutional nets to uh, not just to recognition, but also to producing images. Um, uh, Joshua will probably talk a little more about this also later for kind of unsupervised, in the context of unsupervised learning. This is actually supervised where you give uh, a bunch of instantiation parameters of, say, a chair, uh, so the, the viewpoint and the category of the chair and you know, various other parameters. And you have two convolutional nets, one that generates a mask and one that actually generates the pixels within the mask. And this produces amazing, uh, amazing results of, uh, you know, we can rotate chairs and transform chairs into each other and do chair arithmetics. Um, you know, <laughs> this chair minus that chair plus that chair equals that chair. Um, and, uh, and there are sort of variations of this with autoencoders where you have uh, a convolutional net that kind of produces a bunch of abstract feature vectors that you can then use to uh, generate an image. Uh, this is interesting work by uh, uh, Kokani and uh, in Josh Tenenbaum's lab. Okay, I'm going to hand it up back to. Uh, oh no! Um, yeah, speech, speech recognition. Change. It's me again. All right, let's go very, very quickly about uh, uh, speech recognition. Um, so. There's been a, a, a bit of a revolution in speech recognition over um, the last few years, starting around 2010, 2011. And this is because of the use of deep learning. So the, the knee in the curve that you see here, this is uh, uh, data from Microsoft Research, um, you know, indicates the, the drop in error rate due to the uh, emergence of, of deep learning. And people have been using, uh, at that time, started using uh, fully connected deep neural nets that are applied to the uh, time frequency representation of the speech. And they use it to perform what's called acoustic modeling, which is that like you take a, a piece of uh, uh, you know, time frequency representation of a, a speech signal, and then you produce a, a 
a, a vector of probabilities over uh, states of a hidden Markov model. So the thing, the system tells you the probability that a particular sound has been pronounced if you want. Uh, and then that's used in a kind of decoding algorithm with a hidden Markov model on top. But more recently, people have started using convolutional nets for this application as well. Uh, so this is a, an example of a convolutional net that was uh, put together by a uh, collaboration between uh, my lab at NYU and uh, IBM uh, to do uh, multilingual speech recognition. So you have kind of a bunch of common um, uh, uh, layers at the bottom and then it branches out and you have multiple top layers that correspond to different languages and you train all of those simultaneously. The interesting thing about this is that you get better performance on each individual language when you train on all the language than if you train on each individual language separately. So there is some sort of um, synergy between all the tasks. And the interesting thing about this as well is that it's basically a convolutional net of the same type that we use for image recognition with very little changes instead of you know, just the, the size of the of the layers and, and things like that. And the filters that are learned are you know, things that detect motion and frequency and things of that type. Um, there's some work that uh, Leon Boutou, uh, Joshua, Patrick Hafner, and I did uh, many years ago that consisted in sticking a graphical model on top of a, a neural net to be able to do global training at the sequence level. Uh, in fact, all of these guys did their PhD thesis on this topic in the early 90s. And um, uh, in the mid-90s, we worked on applying this to handwriting recognition. Those are ideas that are being now uh, kind of coming back to the, to the fore because um, uh, very often the outputs of, of those systems is structured and we need to uh, uh, be able to produce a consistent interpretation of, for example, a speech signal or if we do um, a language translation or if we do um, things of that type where the output is structured, we need to be able to take into account the fact that we have a, a language model, for example, and uh, let the system uh, produce the appropriate inputs for it. Okay, now we're gonna talk about natural language representation and I hand it back to Yashua. Right, so um, language is uh, maybe one of the most uh, interesting uh, challenges uh, from the AI point of view. Um, and, uh, and deep learning and representation learning have been uh, making a lot of progress in that direction as well. Um, it started actually in the uh, early uh, 80s with uh, Jeff's ideas about Jeff Hinton's ideas about learning to represent symbols. And uh, around 2000, I, uh, I used some of these ideas of representing symbols by, by patterns of activations to build a language model. So a language model is a uh, model of the probability distribution of sequences of words, and it's obtained by training a machine to predict the probability distribution of the next word given the previous words. And so what I did is I just train a, a neural net uh, which was very big for, the, for those times, uh, in which the first layer maps the word symbols, uh, which you can think of as integers or one-hot vectors, into uh, a vector, a, a representation vector, which we call a, a word embedding or word vector. And then the rest of the network is, is a regular neural net, except that the output layer is now a softmax over uh, the whole vocabulary. So if you have, in those days I did the experiments with 10,000 10, words in the vocabulary. These days uh, we build models with uh, half a million or even millions of words in the vocabulary. Um, what's important here is that uh, uh, before those, those years and until, in fact, recently in uh, statistical language modeling, people were using n-grams, which are essentially based on counting co-occurrence frequencies of uh, small sequences of words. The problem with that is that they don't generalize to new sequences, to new sequences you've never seen, um, whereas here you get generalization to new sequences because words that, uh, that uh, for which we discover representations that are close to each other uh, tend to be semantically close to each other. So if we learn about a sequence of words in the training set, uh, automatically we generalize to similar sequences corresponding to replacing those words by other words that have similar meaning. And this way you get an exponential advantage that's similar to what I was talking about at the beginning of the tutorial. Um, now these, these word embeddings, these vectors are high dimensional, they're like 100 dimensions or 500 dimensions, but you can visualize them by, by using nonlinear dimensional reduction in 2D and you can get these clouds of words and if you zoom in, what you see is that uh, words that have similar meaning, as I was saying, end up close to each other. So here you see countries, for example, and verbs and, and so on. Um, now something really exciting uh, happened a couple of years ago when uh, Mikolov and collaborators found that uh, you can actually play games with these uh, representations, these word vectors, add them, subtract them, and something uh, amazing happens, which is that the network uh, seems to be able to uh, reason by analogy. 
Um, so if you take the representation for um, France and you subtract representation from Paris, you get a vector. If you apply the same vector to Rome, you, you add that vector to Rome, you get something very close to Italy. Similarly, if you take king minus queen, you get something very close to man minus woman. So what is going on is that there is a, a direction in space, in this vector space, that corresponds to different semantic attributes like uh, male versus female. And if, if you think about the representation for king, queen, man, and women, uh, basically the uh, king and queen share all of their attributes except for the male versus female uh, dimension. And so when you subtract one from the other, you only get the male versus female direction. When you apply that same direction to uh, uh, woman, you get, you get man. Um, now, as I mentioned, uh, uh, more recently people have been using these on a large scale when uh, the output of the neural net is supposed to predict the probability distribution over hundreds of thousands or even millions of words, and then uh, it becomes really computationally difficult to train these things. Um, so uh, over the years, people have proposed ways to handle these large output spaces, and there are two basic techniques that have been used. Uh, uh, one uh, set of techniques is based on sampling, uh, and the other is based on uh, um, decomposing the probability distribution into a tree of probabilities. So in the case of sampling, the idea is that if you look at the gradient that we need for the softmax, it has one term that says we want to increase the score of the correct word, and it has uh, a bunch of other terms saying all the other words should have their score pushed down. And the problem is, is all the other words, there's like a million of them, right? So uh, what we're going to do is instead of pushing down all of the other words, we're just going to randomly pick some other word and push them down. So that was the first idea, uh, uh, well that's not, actually not the first idea, but that's one of the ideas that was explored. The other is, uh, instead of picking those words uh, uniformly, we could pick them uh, slightly, uh, into, I mean, uh, smarter by uh, considering a technique called important sampling by sa uh, picking those words that are more likely to have a high score more often. And, and actually this works very well and we have recent ways of doing this uh, that are uh, very efficient for, for GPU implementations that we're, we used in uh, machine translation. The uh, tree structured idea is that you can, you can take any, any discrete probability distribution and, and decompose it as a, as a product of probability. So the probability of finding a leaf here is the probability of starting to, from the root and going, uh, say, left and then right and then left. And that, that, that gives you the probability of the leaf. So you, you can now decompose uh, this, this uh, one out of a large number into a product of a small number of uh, uh, choices. And that's much cheaper to compute when you train. So another interesting idea uh, to go beyond language modeling uh, for things like uh, machine translation is the idea of uh, encoder-decoder framework, where we're going to think of these representations. This is a theme that is going to come back, and you've already seen in Jan's presentation, that uh, what deep learning gives you is a, is a different way of thinking from a machine learning point of view about representations and using representations to build your models. So here, uh, when we want to translate from French to English, we're going to say, well, let's imagine some intermediate representation, which you can think of as a universal representation uh, that might, might work for any language. And we're going to think of a, a box that takes the French sentence and maps to this intermediate representation. And that's what we call the French encoder. And another box that goes from this intermediate representation to the English sentence. So all we need is that, uh, the, these, these, uh, these boxes. And recurrent nets are exactly what we need for that. I mean, you could use other types of, of machinery. But uh, for example, a recurrent net can read the French sentence. And uh, at the end of the sequence, in its internal state, it has a representation of everything it's seen before. Uh, similarly, before, I showed you some recurrent nets that can be used to generate a sequence. So given some initial state or given some conditioning input, we can have a recurrent net that generates the first word. And given the first word, generates the second word. And, and each time updates its state so that the state remembers the words that have already been generated and uses that to produce a probability distribution for the next word. So in this way, we can generate sentences. We can also use things like beam search to find the most likely sequence or approximately the most likely sequence. Now, our first experiments with this, uh, so this started in 2004 in my lab and also uh, at Google. Uh, uh, they worked, but they required really, really large networks in order that was, that was taking forever to train in order to, to learn to translate. And the results were just barely at the state of the art. Uh, one of the things that turned out to be really important to make machine translation work with, uh, with these uh, recurrent nets is the, introduce, the introduction of an attention mechanism. So the idea of the attention mechanism is that um, it's not something that's meant to reduce computation here like it's been done in computer vision. It's a way to uh, make the learner uh, do a better job, learn more easily by focusing on the parts uh, that, that are more relevant and ignoring sort of the clutter. 
Um, so let's, let's consider the machine translation problem. We have a sequence of, uh, of input words and we have a sequence of output words and we want to go from one to the other. So at the input side, we're going to compute some features using our recurrent net or whatever we want. Here it's a bidirectional network. Um, and what we're going to do when we produce the output sequence is that at each step, uh, we're going to decide where in the input sequence we're going to look to, to take our cue about what the next word should be. So in order to do that, we have a little uh, neural net, a little MLP, that uh, takes as input the current state on the output side and the, the, the state of one of the positions in the input side and outputs a score that says, oh, this is the right position to consider when we want to produce the next thing. And we're going to compute a score for each of the possible input positions. And then we're going to take a softmax to get a, a set of weights or probabilities. Uh, we're going to use these to weigh the, the, the feature vectors so that we put more weight on, on those that matter. And then we take this weighted average of features to condition the, the decision about what the next word should be. And we go on from, from the input to the output, uh, from one output word to the next. One important thing here is that what this does for us also is that it allows us to have an output sequence which is not necessarily the same length as, as the input sequence. Uh, the network can decide as it produces output to say, okay, that's it, that's the end. Uh, the symbol I want to produce is end of sentence. Right? So uh, because at each position in the output, we decide which position in input we look at, there's, there's not a hard constraint between the input length and the output length, as unlike in the sort of traditional recurrent nets. So we've used this uh, um, first for uh, uh, English, French machine translation, and we kind of reached uh, the state of the art in uh, 2014. And in 2015, uh, on, on other language pairs, English-German and English-Czech, we actually uh, won the, the competition against the traditional methods that were based on n-grams and, and a very complicated pipeline. Um, and more recently, there has been uh, an important breakthrough using these techniques on uh, a TED Talk machine learning uh, by the team at Stanford led by uh, 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 Chris Manning. And, and there we see an improvement which is not just a few person but something like 25% improvement. Uh, so we're starting to see the kinds of uh, improvements in, in natural language that we've seen in computer vision uh, three years ago. And uh, I think we're going to see more and more in people in the natural language processing community using deep learning for uh, these kinds of, uh, uh, the more semantic tasks, I think, the more these techniques are going to be useful. Another thing uh, uh, where, another place where attention can be useful is in caption generation. So Jan showed you examples of uh, using convolutional nets to extract features that can be used to generate a sequence. So here again, we use a recurrent net that generates the output sequence, but the, re the recurrent net uh, uh, receives as input conditioning information from the, con the convolutional net. But instead of looking everywhere in the image, we can use the attention mechanism, the same as we use for machine translation, actually it was the same code, in order to, to decide at each, for each word where to look in the input image, or rather where to look in the uh, processed image uh, processed by the convolutional net that has a spatial structure. So now as the recurrent net produces one word after the other, we can, we can see where in the image it's paying attention. So here, the place where it's paying attention is highlighted in, in, in light, and uh, we can see that it says, looking at this image, it says a zebra standing in a field of tall grass, and uh, when it's talking about the, the zebra, it's focusing on the zebra. When it's focusing on, on talking on, on the grass, it's, it's focusing on the grass. And here's some more examples where, where I'm showing you where it's focusing for a particular word. So here it's looking at this image. It's saying a woman is throwing a frisbee in the park. And when it's saying frisbee, it's focusing on the frisbee. Here it's looking at this image of a dog. And when it's, uh, uh, it's, and it's saying a dog is standing on a hardwood floor. And when it's saying dog, it's, it's, it's looking at the image of the dog. And, and, and you can also use this for debugging. So uh, you know, it's something that's interesting in, with, with these networks to try to figure out what is going on. Uh, where is it failing? So uh, if we look, for example, at the second image here, uh, it's looking at this image of a woman and it says a woman holding a clock in her hand and when it says clock, which is wrong here because there's no clock, it's actually looking in this place where there's a pattern on her shirt that looks maybe like a clock. So we see that there was a confusion somewhere in the probably the, 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 the vision part uh, or the translation of that to uh, a word uh, that, that created that mistake. Um, you want to go? So an interesting development over the last, uh, the last year is um, uh, techniques by which uh, neural nets are augmented by, uh, by memory. So there is this, um, uh, so Joshua kind of already talked to the, 
about this a little bit in the sense that those attention mechanisms you can think of as ways of addressing a memory that where the memory is not kind of a stored history, but more kind of features that have been observed or maybe a sequence of words that have been observed in the past. So, so if I might say so, uh, instead of paying attention at different locations in the input, we can pay attention at different locations in our cognitive space, in our memory. And that's, that's the, the technique that's being used here, and that's really making a, a big impact these days in reasoning and uh, natural language understanding. Right, so th these are called, uh, in general, uh, memory augmented uh, neural nets or memory augmented networks. Uh, and there are several techniques for this that people have been experimenting with in various contexts. Um, so there is the, the um, uh, of course, LSTM could be seen as, as a, a type of that, uh, of, of uh, kind of augmenting neural nets with memory, uh, uh, although a, a fairly simple form of it. Uh, there's another uh, model by uh, uh, Weston, uh, Board and Chopra uh, from Facebook called Memory Network, where um, essentially the system has some sort of associative memory that is addressed, can be addressed uh, the, by, uh, by content, essentially. So you have uh, uh, a word that comes in or a piece of text that comes in. It's embedded into a vector. This vector is used as an address to match to a bunch of uh, addresses that already exist. And then when one of those matches, the, uh, the corresponding um, uh, word is, is, is fed to the network again, and so the network can cycle uh, through various reads and, and writes to the memory. Uh, there's a model um, which kind of simulates a, a Turing machine, it's called a neural Turing machine by Graves et al. from DeepMind, where the memory is a tape, and the, the neural net can choose to kind of move left or right uh, on that tape and, and read or write, write to it. So here's an example of how the memory network uh, works. Uh, I apologize for people in the back, it might be difficult for you to read. Uh, this is a uh, 16 sentence version of Lord of the Rings. Uh, if you haven't read the book or seen the movie, don't read the last few sentences because um, <laughs> it's a spoiler. But, um, but basically the memory network reads, uh, reads those, those, um, those, those sentences and kind of stores them in its memory. It's not very selective, it just stores all of them in some sort of encoding. And, uh, and then you can ask questions. Uh, where is the ring? And the system kind of goes over the memory and kind of figures out which fact is relevant for this. Of course, it's been trained to match uh, queries with, um, with, uh, with memories uh, in, in sort of a question answering type, type system. Where is Bibo now in Grey Heavens? Where is Frodo now Shire? Uh, these guys have actually come up together with Tomasz Mikolov and, uh, um, uh, and a couple of other people. They've, they've come up with sort of a, a more sophisticated set of questions that can be asked the, those systems. Um, there is a, a, a refinement of it uh, called end-to-end -end memory network where this one is, is basically not supervised. So you don't have to tell the system which piece of memory is relevant during training to answer a particular question. It kind of figures it out by itself by kind of trial and error if you want, using the reinforced algorithm. Um, and uh, it's a very uh, in interesting piece of work. And there is uh, work by uh, uh, Armand Joulin and Tomasz Mikolov also at Facebook on uh, a recurrent net that's augmented by a stack. And they've used this to sort of learn very simple languages or learn simple operations on, on uh, like sorting and things of that type. Um, um, so there's a lot of space to explore this. It's a very hot topic at the moment, uh, or, you know, memory augmented neural nets. And, and we think, uh, you know, a lot of people think that it might be the ticket to kind of go to the next level and, um, and sort of allow uh, Learning yeah, systems to kind of reason and, and there's a lot of work uh, in other labs, uh, particular at Google and DeepMind, on using uh, these types of things uh, for for reasoning, for uh, learning to program, for uh, manipulating data structures. So the traditional realm of uh, deep learning and neural nets, which was sort of pattern recognition, is moving into AI types of tasks. Also for playing games. Um, Maybe I could go with that. Uh, yeah. So um, there's something interesting to note about the memory network, which is connected to the problem of long-term dependencies I mentioned earlier. Um, when you store something in the memory, so the, the, the figure here represents the state of the memory at different time steps. So what happens is that the recurrent net, which controls the memory, uh, uh, reads or writes to it at different locations. Uh, a different time step. So when it, it stores something uh, at a particular time step, that thing can stay for a very long time. And of course, the information will be propagated. It will just be copied. The gradients, when you, when you train this, will just be back propagated through this. They will not be vanishing for this location. And so you can have information stored for a very long time and, and, and capture very long-term dependencies. So that's, that's one of the reasons why this is, this is working really well. Um, now, I'd like to uh, move on to uh, a more sort of abstract topic, which is 
uh, why is it that these networks are able to do well? And maybe we can do even better if we understand what's going on. And maybe a very important question is, how is it that humans are able to generalize to new tasks from very few examples? So this is called transfer learning. Uh, and uh, you know, we have examples of, of humans generate, generalizing to new tasks from a single example, or even no example if you can describe the task maybe in, in natural language. So how is that possible? From a machine learning point of view, it looks like you need thousands of examples of each category in order to do something reasonable. Um, so, so there are different, different uh, priors or different assumptions that you need, and, and representation learning allows you to build in these kinds of, uh, of assumptions. One of them is uh, that we can use uh, ex excess inputs from other tasks or from the same task but which are unlabeled in order to help us for the task at hand. So that's going to assume that p of x, the, the distribution of the inputs, is somehow related to p of y given x, the, 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 the distribution we actually want to learn when we don't predict y given x. Um, so this idea was used in uh, uh, the use of unsupervised learning for learning representations uh, on, on one set of tasks and then applying them on another task. Uh, in particular, in, in 2011, we won two uh, international competitions on transfer learning using these techniques that uh, do unsupervised learning on, on the uh, data from, from different tasks, and then do supervised learning from those representations on new tasks. And what you see on these curves is that uh, on the x-axis, you have the log of the number of examples. On the y-axis is accuracy. Uh, as you go deeper and deeper with those representations, the learning curves, in other words, the number, the accuracy you get for different examples rises faster and faster, meaning it's really able to, uh, to nail the task with uh, very few examples. So, uh, so one, one common thing uh, Jan showed uh, is multitask learning and the examples of uh, multiple languages for speech recognition, but uh, this is also used in object recognition. You, you share the lower layers of a neural net and then you can have a specialized path for different tasks or maybe directly connect them to the shared layer. Uh, the underlying assumption here is that there are underlying features or factors that are going to be represented uh, at the top level of the shared part of the network that are appropriate or that can be shared across multiple tasks. And it's because there are these shared uh, factors, these shared features that exist in, in, the, in, in the world that, that this thing is working and that you're able, able to generalize very quickly from, from very few examples on a new task. Um, you can play this game also by, combine, by looking at multiple modalities. So uh, one of the few, uh, first few works in this direction is uh, coming from uh, uh, Google, actually my brother Sammy and collaborators uh, Jason Weston and Nicolas Usignier were working on uh, Google image search. And uh, here you want to share representations between two modalities. So one modality is image, the other is uh, words, um, the, the, the kind of uh, uh, queries that you put in Google image search. And they want to learn a mapping from image to representation, as well as a mapping from query to representation, such that um, the, the you know, the image for dolphin goes to roughly the same place as the uh, query for dolphin. At the same time, you want to push away the representations for other images or other key, uh, queries that don't match. And this is similar to the kind of objective function that Jan talked about earlier. You can also play that game uh, on the input side. So imagine you have two different uh, types of uh, data sets um, uh, where you're trying maybe to predict different things, but some of the variables uh, are shared. So maybe you have, you have one table that talks about events, URLs, and persons, and the other that talks about browsing history, words, and URLs. Well, because URLs is used in both of these, you could learn a representation for URLs, which is common to these two tasks, and use them in, 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 in a way that uh, you, know, you basically train these two models together with weight sharing so that you can share gradients between those two models. Um, you can also play this kind of game uh, of sharing representations to do things like speaker adaptation or handling multiple modalities where you, you learn uh, maybe a specialized map for each speaker to a representation that's going to be speaker uh, uh, independent. Uh, a more general scheme here for sharing between uh, tasks and representations uh, allows you to do what's called uh, zero-shot learning or uh, uh, generalize very quickly from, from new tasks. So here, consider two modalities, x and y. So the raw data here uh, are uh, uh, maybe supervised pairs, x, y. But you may also have unlabeled cases of just x's or unlabeled cases of just y's. So using the unlabeled cases of x's, you can learn a representation for the x's. So maybe the x's are, are images. So you can learn a representation for each image such that uh, 
um, uh, the images that are semantically close to each other are close in the representation space. So we learn a function fx that maps x to its representation. Same thing for y. Maybe a y is a sentence, and we learn a representation for sentences by just training on, on corpora. Now, uh, having those two representations, you can also train to relate the x's and the y's. But instead of doing it in the raw space, which is, is a bad idea, you do it in the space of representations. And now you can, you can learn to relate those representations uh, in, in those two spaces. And now what you, you gain from this is that somebody gives you a new category, like a new type of y, and you can, you can project it to the, the, the y space and, and, and relate it to the x's. And so you can generalize to words you've never seen, for example, uh, in the terms of the labeled set x, y. But those words have been seen in uh, conjunction with other words in, in say, la natural language corpora. All right. Um, the last big piece we want to talk about is unsupervised learning. And this is maybe one of the most uh, difficult challenges for machine learning and for deep learning. Uh, it's also very important. Uh, because we don't believe that we're going to reach AI by using the recipe that uh, has been so success successful up to now that of mostly using uh, supervised learning. We can't label everything that the computer has to do. So we'd like the computer to be more autonomous, to take just the data that exists, maybe some labeled data as well, and figure out how the world works. Right? This is, this is the dream. But for this, it needs to be able to um, discover the uh, underlying structure uh, without having us to tell what are all the categories, for example. Uh, if we are able to do well on this task, actually we're able to do other things. We're able to answer new questions. You can think of supervised learning as a specific kind of question we want a machine to answer. Given x, answer y. Whereas unsupervised learning is, well, given any subset of the, of the variables, you can predict any other subset. This is also important in tasks where the output is complicated as a joint distribution, for example, in machine translation or scene segmentation. And uh, the, the, the issues that arise in unsupervised learning are the same where we, we're trying to capture the joint distribution of a bunch of, of factors or variables are the same that arise when, when you uh, work with these uh, conditional joint distribution or what's called structured output models. OK. Now, there's a piece of good news here uh, that's uh, coming from uh, Bernard Shomkov's uh, uh, lab. Who, uh, they're studying causality. And, um, and, and uh, they, they, they found that depending on the direction of causality between the x and the y, so x is your input, y is the thing you want to predict, uh, you're either in for uh, a good time or uh, you're in trouble. So if um, y is a cause of x, then um, using the unlabeled examples of x, so modeling p of x, is going to be helpful, typically is going to be helpful to build your classifier that predicts y given x. Um, the reason is that if, um, if x is a cause of y, which is the, the, the bad case, um, it means that uh, the world is basically generating x and in a way that doesn't depend on y. And then given x, it's generating y. right? And so. Looking at the x's doesn't tell you anything about the relationship between x and y. On the other hand, if the way the world uh, is generating the data is first come up with uh, y and maybe other things, which we can think of the causes, and then these causes are combined in order to produce x, then by just observing x, you can discover some structure that tells you about the causes, and, and then essentially it can help you to do supervised learning. So to make that more concrete, um, Consider the simple case of a uh, mixture of, of three Gaussians here. Uh, and the, 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 the input is x. The thing we eventually want to predict is y. Uh, but it turns out that by just observing x, a, a good statistical model should tell you that you have these three bumps. You have these three modes. And, and now I just need essentially one example per class to figure out what the label should be for each of these bumps. Right? Uh, it's because the, the, the data generating uh, the process has this structure that goes from the causes to the data that we're able to do that. And uh, if we uh, are able to do unsupervised learning that discovers the underlying causes, then uh, we'll be able to do supervised learning or any other task much more easily. So this is connected to another issue, uh, which is invariance. Uh, a very traditional approach in pattern recognition is to try to eliminate from your data the aspects that you don't care about. So if you're doing object recognition, you want uh, your uh, features to be invariant to rotation, translation, and things like that. But if you're doing unsupervised learning, you don't know what the right uh, invariances are. So what you could do instead is try to uh, extract 
uh, and separate and disentangle these factors. So maybe there is object identity and object position. Maybe there is, uh, uh, in speech, there is uh, the, the phoneme identity and the speaker identity. And, and, and depending on the task, you might want to recognize a speaker or recognize a speech. If you're able to separate them, then uh, any of those tasks become easy. So now let's go and look a little bit at what has been done to uh, use neural nets for unsupervised learning. And uh, I would say the, the grandfather of all of these is the Boltzmann machine. It's an uh, undirected graphical model. Um, and it represents explicitly the probability distribution by a, uh, the, by, by, by a formula where you have a normalized exponential of what's called the energy. And the energy is a simple parameterized function, so it's just a quadratic function here of, uh, of the inputs or the uh, latent variables. Um, so one thing about the, these kinds of models is that in order to sample from, from these distributions, you have to resort to uh, an iterative scheme, a kind of stochastic relaxation, which is called a, a Monte Carlo Markov chain. And uh, one issue is that we need to actually sample from the models when we train. And, uh, and that causes problems because sampling from the model, when the model is very strong, when it, it has a lot of uh, peaky modes, uh, is difficult. What happens is that these Markov chains, they go by small steps. And these small steps want to go to uh, probable configuration. So if you're um, at one of the modes, it's going to move around that mode. But uh, if that mode is uh, uh, strongly separate, is, is well separated from other modes, it's going to be very difficult, very unlikely to make moves that bring you to these other modes. And that's going to make training a bit difficult. Um, so one particular form of Boltzmann machine is the RBM, which uh, uh, introduces an extra constraint where you have uh, input units and hidden units. And there's no connection between the inputs and no connection between the hidden. And that kind of simplifies the sampling to some extent. And that has been uh, used a lot in, 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 uh, in unsupervised learning work. Um, one general principle for training these kinds of models in the more general family of, of models is that this uh, energy, uh, which corresponds directly to probability, uh, is going to be something we want to manipulate during training. So what we would really like is to have the training examples to have a low energy to have a high probability. So what we, what we do during training essentially is push down the energy of the training examples, the x plus here, uh, where you have the dots in the animation. And you want to push up in the other places. And initially, maybe the model puts low energy in the wrong places. And what you want to do is uh, sample those wrong places more often so that you can push them up. That's, that's a very basic principle that, uh, that has been used. But there are other. Um, there's actually a whole list of other approaches to, to do that. I don't know if you want to. Sure, I'll say a few words about some of those. So it's a laundry list of techniques. It's very easy to make the uh, energy. When you have an energy function that's parameterized, and I give you a point x, uh, you can compute the derivative of the energy of that point with respect to the parameters. And so you can make the energy of that point go down. That's very easy. The problem is, how do you make sure the energy of other points is higher? And so. Um, you have a number of different strategies. The, the, first, um, uh, the first strategy, of course, is uh, you build a machine in such a way that the volume of low energy stuff is constant. So whenever you give low energy to certain areas, the energy of other areas automatically goes up because there is a limited volume of things that can take low energy. So you can reinterpret classic methods like PCA, k-means, uh, Gaussian mixture models, and square ICA in this, uh, in this context. They are of this kind, essentially. You can push down the energy of data points and push up everywhere else. This is basically maximum likelihood uh, if you do it in the appropriate way. Um, but you need a tractable, uh, tractable partition function for this. You can push down the energy of data points and push up on chosen locations, maybe around the data points. And that's basically what the Boltzmann machine learning algorithm does with contrastive divergence. Um, and there's other methods to do this as well. You can minimize the gradient of the energy function with respect to the state and maximize the curvature around data points. That's called score matching. It's very difficult to apply in complex models, unfortunately. You can train a dynamical system so that the dynamics uh, of running the system goes towards the manifold of high data density. And uh, a particular implementation of this is an idea by uh, Pascal Vincent and, uh, and, and, and Joshua uh, called the denoising autoencoder. Uh, there's various other uh, ideas around this, uh, this idea. Uh, you can use a regularizer that limits the volume of space that has low energy. So instead of forcing the volume to be constant, you just say, uh, here's a term that measures the volume of stuff that actually has low energy, and I'm going to push down on that. Um, an example of this is uh, sparse coding and sparse autoencoders. Um, these are methods I actually like very much. I've worked with this, uh, these things a lot. 
Um, and they are actually quite efficient to learn unsupervised features. The thing is, right now, for when you have large data sets, you're better off just using uh, supervised learning. Um, and then there are other ideas that uh, Yoshua has been exploring, um, and uh, people in my lab as well, where um, you, you make the energy some sort of square difference between uh, the, 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 the vector you're modeling and some function of that vector, and you try to make this function as constant as possible um, uh, everywhere, but it has to reconstruct. And so it cannot be constant along the manifold because it has to be able to reconstruct y, and the result is that it's constant in, the, uh, um, in, that, in that direction. Um, but it's not constant in the, uh, the, uh, the other direction. Um, and there are ideas around the, uh, the uh, models that use this idea called the contracting autoencoder out of uh, uh, Yoshua's lab and saturating autoencoder out of my lab. Adversarial training is uh, the new kid on the block. Um, this was proposed by Ian Goodfellow when he was a student with, uh, with Yoshua. And it's a very interesting technique that has a lot of people excited. Uh, but before we talk about this, we'll talk about autoencoder. Yes. Um, so, uh, we're going to go through some of the things that Jan talked about. Uh, many of these uh, use uh, a kind of architecture which is related to the autoencoder. Uh, so, typically, you're going to have two pieces in these models. There is the encoder part and the decoder part. You can think of uh, the encoder part, we've, we've seen these kinds of things before already in the tutorial. They map from input to some representation and the decoder part map from uh, representation to uh, reconstruction. Um, so the denoising of encoder in particular is an example where when we're going to train, instead of providing the clean input, we're going to provide a corrupted input and it's going to try to reconstruct uh, uh, something that looks like the clean input. Um, another uh, recent uh, augmentation of this is to think of the, the encoder and the decoder instead of uh, deterministic functions, think of them as conditional distribution. So we have a conditional distribution that goes from input to representation. So we're going to be able to sample an explanation for the input. We can think of the representation now as an explanation. And, uh, and, and similarly, we're going to think of the decoder as something that goes from the space of representations to, uh, to the uh, input space. And again, it could be a, a conditional distribution. So given an explanation, like uh, given a particular choice of uh, who's in the picture, where they are, and so on, uh, maybe the, de the details of the pixels might be different, so we have a distribution. Um, in, and in this scheme, uh, we often introduce another uh, player, which is a prior distribution. So if you wanted to generate just from the decoder, what you would do is you would have a model that captures the distribution in, at the representation space rather than uh, in the input space. So this is going to be easier to model. It might even be just independent factors. So sampling from this prior is going to be very easy, typically. And then we send that through uh, either deterministic or stochastic uh, decoder that's going to produce a sample. So we're going to see these ingredients in many algorithms. They're already present in the RBM, where uh, we go from, uh, during training, for example, we go from input to representation, uh, back to input, and we, we cycle through in this way. Uh, and these are the undirected models where you need a kind of relaxation, where you go uh, encode, decode, encode, decode many times. And there are other kinds of algorithms uh, which are corresponding to directed graphical models. They come from an, uh, a model called the Helmholtz machines that came uh, from Hinton and collaborators in the mid 90s, uh, in which the way to generate is in one pass. You don't need to go encode, decode, encode, decode. What, the way you generate is you first generate a representation at the top level using your prior, and then you uh, apply the decoder, which could be stochastic, and you generate your, your data in one pass. So this is convenient if you can make that work. But these are the two styles of uh, of, uh, of, of architectures that people are, are using. So one of, uh, one of the particular institutions is the PSD. So PSD is a particular type. That means uh, predictive sparse decomposition. It's a particular type of sparse autoencoder. Um, and uh, the way it works is you, um, so you, you have an encoder here that takes the input and predicts a code. And then you have a decoder that takes a code and reconstructs the input. And you have two factors. This is kind of a factor graph where the circles are the variables and the, rectang the rectangles are kind of uh, factors in an energy function, or sort of addi additive terms in an energy function or factors in a probability if you take exponentials. And so, uh, so this guy goes into the decoder and you measure the, some sort of distance between the, the reconstruction and the in observed input. And this guy goes into another distance that measures the discrepancy between the, the code and the prediction from the, the encoder. Those encoders can be very simple, maybe uh, one or two layers neural net, or they can be very complicated, it can be an entire convolutional net. Same for this guy. Uh, and here there is uh, a sparsity uh, term which uh, 
pushes this vector to have a small number of non-zero uh, values in it. And it's, it is this term that limits the volume of stuff that can be reconstructed. So there's a major issue with autoencoders, which is that if you make the dimension of z larger than the dimension of y, and you make those functions as, uh, you know, sufficiently powerful, then this autoencoder can learn the identity function and basically not do anything for you. It will reconstruct every single point, um, and your energy surface will be flat because it will all be zero. The reconstruction error will be zero uh, all over the space. So what you have to do now is push up on the energy of points you don't see, and you do this by limiting the amount of information contained in this code. You can do this by making it smaller, which is what PCA does, or you can make it, you can do it by making it sparse, and that's what the idea of sparse, uh, sparse autoencoders. So PSD has, you know, involves inference uh, in that variable as opposed to kind of directly feeding the output of the encoder to the input of the decoder. Right, so um, in the early days, in the 80s, when people started playing with autoencoders, uh, they were kind of uh, a heuristic unsupervised learning technique, maybe related to principal components analysis, but there was not much of a, an interpretation in terms of capturing the uh, data distribution. It was not clear if training an autoencoder would tell you uh, something about the distribution in general or some specific aspect. It turns out in recent years that we found uh, a number of results that tell us that indeed with, with, uh, with the particular, way of, particular ways of training autoencoders, you actually capture the data distribution. So I'm gonna tell you about some of these. Um, so in the case of the denoising autoencoder, what we showed is that uh, the difference between the reconstruction and the input converges to uh, what's called a score. So the derivative of the log of the density of the data with respect to its input. So it, 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 the way it's trained, basically, you know, you see what that happens. If the data is, is, is near a, a manifold and you corrupt it, then what it learns is to go from the corrupted data towards the manifold. So it learns this vector field, and you can actually do the experiments. It learns this vector field where uh, the reconstruction minus the input vector points where the, the data is, where the energy should be low. Um, the other thing we showed is that uh, if you do the encode, decode, encode, decode step with the, the, the noise injected, you, that creates a Markov chain whose stationary distribution uh, is an estimator of the data distribution. So this is very much like the uh, uh, RBMs and so on, except that we don't have a, a parametric representation of the distribution. We have a parametric representation of the Markov chain operator that goes from one stage to the next stage. Um, the other thing that Jan talked about is the uh, sort of local constancy idea. Um, so again, you, uh, remember I said that the reconstruction minus the input corresponds to the gradient of the log likelihood of the log density or the, the energy. So uh, in places where the data is, we want the, the, uh, the gradient of the energy to be zero. Uh, so we want these to be minima of the energy, meaning that the reconstruction is gonna be equal to, uh, to the input. So this, this graph shows the input on, on, on the x-axis and the reconstruction on the y-axis. So the, the identity line is where the data points should be. And so, um, but, but also we want the, the energy to be flat around, the derivative should be zero around the data point. So what you get is a, a kind of reconstruction function is gonna be flat around the data point and then between modes uh, is gonna have these abrupt transitions. And uh, if, you, if you integrate this, you see that the corresponding energy function has these, uh, these, uh, uh, these holes around the data points, which is exactly what you want. Um, uh, uh, more recently, there's been a lot of uh, interest in the uh, so-called Helmholtz machines I was telling you about earlier, and in particular, a family of algorithms called the variational autoencoders was proposed by a number of groups. And um, the idea here is that uh, we're gonna train simultaneously the, the encoder part and the decoder part in such a way that we not only, we not only minimize reconstruction error, but uh, we inject this noise at all the levels now, just, not just the input, uh, in such a way that uh, we actually obtain as an objective function a, a, a lower bound on the log likelihood. Um, one interesting way to think about this also is that we have two ways of generating the data. One is uh, the, the, we generate from the top and we decode and we generate X. And the other way is we sample from the dis data distribution and we go up and do the approximate inference. And we like these two ways to coincide. And actually the training objective is the KL divergence between these two ways of obtaining the data and the latent variables. Um, so, so uh, yeah, okay, so let me uh, skip a few things here. Some images uh, that have been generated with these kinds of, of algorithms uh, on street view house numbers. Uh, one trick that's been used to try to figure out if the network 
that generates, uh, is generating things without overfitting uh, is to take a training example and find the closest example in the data set. So here you see that it's generated examples, but the nearest example in the data set, in the training set uh, doesn't look anything like it. Uh, so it's not just uh, memorizing training examples, because you could have a generator that generates things that look very nice, but just copies training examples, right? This wouldn't be very good. So this is a common technique that are being used. Um, uh, one last um, type of generator I want to spend some time on is the generative adversarial networks that uh, Jan introduced. Um, and so, so again, this, this was uh, something come, uh, from Jan Goodfellow and, and, and collaborators and myself in, in my lab and was published just one year ago, but there's been a number of papers following up on this and it seems to be very, very promising. So here's the idea. Uh, we're going to train two boxes. One is a, what we call a discriminator. Here's a uh, discriminator and one is a generator. So the generator is like the decoder we were talking about earlier. We, we, we uh, sample a random vector, we send it through the generator and we get, say, some fake image. Uh, the discriminator is going to be trained to classify between the fake images cr uh, coming from the generator and the real images coming from the data set. So it's just a normal classifier. Now, this is, that tells us how to train the discriminator. The way we can train the generator is we're going to backprop from the discriminator in order to fool the discriminator. So we're going to maximize the probability uh, that the output of the discriminator says, oh, it's a real image when we train the generator. So the generator is sort of uh, 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 in an adversarial game. It's, a, it's actually game theory that we use to analyze this setup uh, with the discriminator. Um, and um, there was uh, a development of this uh, just a, a few months ago um, at, uh, at uh, 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 NYU and Facebook, where they use a sequence of, uh, of generators uh, each of them generating a, a sort of high resolution version of the image given a low resolution version of the image. And uh, they were able to generate images that were much, much better than anything that was possible before. Uh, in fact, they asked humans uh, to look at the generated images. So there's a sequence of generation going from uh, low resolution to gradually more and more resolution. And if you look at the generated images and you ask humans, are these natural or not? Uh, you, you actually find that 40% uh, of the samples generated by the model were mistaken by humans for real photos. And there's a even more recent work um, that uses a convolutional version of this uh, and, and a few tricks that seem to work incredibly well. And you see the kinds of, this was trained on scenes, uh, bedroom scenes, you see the kinds of bedroom scenes that it's generating. Uh, one of the things they're doing uh, in order to see if uh, this works well, and, we've, and other people have been doing this, is trying to interpolate in the, um, uh, let me show you, interpolate in image space and then generate images. So here you have a sequence of images that were generated by going from one point in the uh, latent space to another point in the latent space and drawing a straight line and then generating uh, all the uh, x corresponding to all the h's in between. So to, to understand this, let me show you this picture. Um, so in the h space, uh, we have two points and uh, if we consider the linear interpolation between those two points and everything in between looks like a natural image, it means that the, the manifold of images that was originally twisted uh, has actually been flattened. Right? In, in image space, if you take, for example, the image of a 9 and the image of a 3 and you do a linear interpolation, the things you get are just additions of 9s and 3s and they don't look like natural images. But if instead you do this linear interpolation in the space of the representations, uh, and if the representations are good, if the model is doing a good job of capturing, capturing the, the manifold structure, then when you generate from those uh, 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 high level representations, you get things that are, that are nice and, and look like you're you know, uh, actually doing things like inserting a window and, and adding furniture and things like that. You can also, once you, you, you think about the representation space, you can play the same kinds of games we played with words, like take the image of a man with glasses in its representation uh, in the latent space, subtract the image of the same man uh, uh, without glasses, and add the representation of a, a, a woman without glasses, and now you get images of, of women with glasses. So ultimately what we'd like is um, an algorithm that seamlessly does supervised learning and unsupervised learning uh, without, with a single learning rule. So the Boltzmann machine has this property that uh, it's neither supervised nor unsupervised. It depends on how you use it. If you, uh, um, if you clamp certain units all the time and you ask the system to predict certain other units all the time, then it's supervised. Uh, but if you don't tell it in advance which, one, which units will need to be 
uh, predicted, then it's unsupervised. And so it'd be nice to have algorithms that can do this. And, um, um, and, and the, the, the solution to this is probably uh, you know, a ticket to kind of you know, big progress in unsupervised learning. So the, the main issue comes from the fact that when you take an image, let's say, and you run, a, say, a convolutional net to produce uh, labels, this is a many-to-one mapping. And so if you want to use a kind of an autoencoder type architecture, you need to go from the, wet to, from the, the label to the image, and it's a, a one-to-many uh, mapping. It's not a function. And so you either have to resort to uh, uh, sampling and probabilistic methods or use other tricks. And that's uh, kind of one of uh, the areas of interest that people are working on at the moment. Um, so one of the solutions to this is, um, is to actually stack, um, I mean, there are several solutions to this, some, some of which involves the variational autoencoders or RBMs, those are kind of the probabilistic methods, or the ladder network, or another model that uh, 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 we've been working on in, in, my, in my lab as well, uh, called the stacked uh, wetware autoencoders. So here the idea is you, you essentially have little autoencoders that kind of cycle on themselves and you stack them up and, and each uh, layer tries to predict what the reconstruction um, uh, uh, is. So this is the, the one I was uh, mentioning earlier, the stack wear autoencoder. Here the way we solve the problem of non-invertibility is that uh, each uh, layer in the system is composed of a convolution which is a, a kind of a one-to-one -one mapping if you want. Um, and the pooling which contracts, so the, the pooling is where information is lost. And when we do the pooling, we, we uh, preserve the complementary information that would allow us to reconstruct the input from the information extracted by this, by this encoder. So on the way back, uh, when we have uh, the features coming from the top that are equivalent to those when uh, going up, we also use the complementary information to allow us to reconstruct. And so this, this entire mapping here is actually a function. It's a mini to one mapping, not a, a kind of one to many mapping. Okay, so we're gonna just conclude with a few uh, cosmic remarks. Um, uh, basically, the, the goal of uh, machine learning is to you know, figure out the, how the world works, um, and we certainly don't have the solutions to that problem. So uh, unsupervised learning is really an unsolved problem, and uh, there is a sense from, from some of us that the solution to that problem um, will uh, bring about a, kind of a new, um, uh, quantum leap in, in the, the kind of things we can do with machine learning. So for example, a very simple problem is um, I show you a segment of a video and I ask you what is going to be the, the next frame, draw me the next frames. And if you train a neural net to do this, it doesn't work very well. The reason is because the world is unpredictable. There are things that you just cannot predict from the observations. And if you train uh, the system to just predict a frame uh, using say squared error, um, it's going to, um, essentially, the best you can do is produce an average of all the possible things that could happen, and what you get is a blurry picture. So how do we get out of that problem, which is the same problem as I was mentioning earlier, is, uh, is one of the solutions to it. All right, so, um, yeah, I guess one important message here is that what deep learning brings us is the idea that we should pay attention to representations, and in particular, to how these representations can help us uh, capture a high level of abstractions. This is really how we're going to get better generalization in the future. We've already seen a lot of uh, amazing applications, uh, but there are still a lot of things to do, a lot of open problems. Unsupervised learning remains uh, really uh, tricky. Uh, applications of unsupervised learning, like the semi-supervised uh, ladder network here, is already uh, getting pretty impressive results. So on MNIST, for those who know about this, Using only 100 labeled examples, uh, uh, these, these uh, Finnish guys were able to obtain 1% error on, on the test set, which is uh, amazing, which is almost the same as what people used to get with the full training set. Uh, there are lots of other challenges. Uh, we've talked about long-term dependencies. I think one really hot thing these days is natural language understanding and reasoning, question answering. Uh, there remain a lot of uh, hard questions about how to train neural nets better. Uh, and uh, how to train them on, 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 in a way that scales, like distributed training. Uh, there are a lot of interesting questions to relate the things we, we're doing with biology. Uh, the, we, there is a lot of inspiration from biology, but we, we'd like to uh, make the connection uh, better now. And of course, there's a lot of work in incorporating and improving uh, reinforcement learning using uh, deep learning techniques. So thank you very much. Thank you.
All right, so the mechanics of taking questions are that you identify the microphones that are on the aisles, and then you just go up to them and ask your question. So we'll take the one on that side. Uh, yeah. Can, can you hear me? Yep. Uh, my name is uh, Jürgen Schmidhuber from the Swiss AI Lab, uh, IDSIA. And uh, I don't have time for all the comments that I uh, would like to make on this tutorial. Uh, however, um, let, me, let me just make one which uh, relates to uh, the beginning where you explained back propagation in this modular fashion and um, where the blurb on your website even mentions that one of you guys, uh, Hinton, uh, pioneered back propagation. I think it's important to mention that this was invented much earlier and the method that everybody's using uh, today is of course the one by Lina Inma, 1970, who, um, who uh, devised this efficient way of computing gradients backwards in uh, differentiable graphs of differentiable nodes and even 10 actually, years before actually that, the control even, theorists figured this out in the early 60s. So this even, is actually even 10 years older. before uh, the mathematical foundations were laid by Kelly in 1960, Kelly, uh, yeah. and uh, 1961 Bryson. So I think it's important to give credit not only to the popularizers but also to the inventors of the basic methods that everybody's using today. If so you want to le learn more about that, just read the um, Scholopedia article on deep learning. Thanks. <laughs> so we want. We weren't being particularly historical for backprop. We actually didn't say anything about the history of it, so we didn't say anything wrong. But uh, no, I mean there is a long history of people using chain rule. That's that's true, uh, going back to you know Leibniz and, and Newton. Um, uh, certainly, the control theorists used this. Leibniz uh, didn't have it. It was Kelly, Bryson, Lina, Inma. Certainly, the, the control theorists in the early 60s uh, uh, used this for. Uh, you know, basically figuring out the control law for you know shooting rockets and stuff like that. Uh, it's in a book in from 1968 by Bryson and Ho, and that refers to all the, the papers you're referring to. Those people never used this for machine learning. They never figured out it could be used for machine learning. So uh, that came much later, maybe in the 70s. It was ignored. Yeah, and, but uh, back then, of course, computers were 10 billion times lower than today, and nobody could use it, which just shows how far ahead of time these guys really were. So give credit to the inventors. Same, uh, same reason here for you know, commercial nets who basically couldn't be used uh, in a large scale until fairly recently because machines weren't fast enough. What a question. Uh, thank you for the uh, nice tutorial. Uh, I have a question about uh, natural language processing or understanding. Uh, my question is, how we can represent negation, things like not, in a hierarchical way? Do you have uh, any idea about that? So we know that it does represent negation. So in order to get the kind of performance we are getting on machine translation, for example, it's clear that the recurrent nest that is reading, say, the French sentence is, is, is capturing the presence of negation. And the reason it's able to do that is that it has very strong nonlinearities in it. Uh, we don't know the exact uh, detail of how particular constructions like negation are represented, although some people are investigating that. So you can look at the word of, uh, work of Richard Socher, for example. Uh, but it's clear that it's, it, they're learning to do that very efficiently. Thank you. Me? Uh. Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh. My name is Raghavan. I'm from a company called Deep Learning. That's deeplearni.ng. Uh, I've a. Uh, I'm curious. What personally do you are you guys most excited about in terms of the future of deep learning, and also in industry? So like a, applied applications. Well, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm interested in an open question. So there, I think there are. There's a number of them. The first one I mentioned already. How, how the hell do we do unsupervised running? Look here. Yeah. Oh, just uh, most pardon, excited. Most pardon excited. my French. Uh, but I think there are kind of you know, very interesting avenues there to explore. The second one is the mixture of uh, representation learning, deep learning with reasoning, with search, with memory. In fact, there's a whole workshop on, the, on this topic uh, later uh, uh, in the week called RAM, uh, which means reasoning. Uh, um, uh, I can't remember what the yeah, is meant for. Uh, and memory. And. Um, uh, so th those are the two things I think where very interesting things happen, and uh, I think the, the the revolution in natural language processing has been announced, but has not yet completely happened. Uh, we're starting to see hints of it, but it's not uh, it's not been the same kind of success as we've seen in speech and and uh, and, and vision. So there, there's a lot to do there. 
uh, possibly based on those methods that, uh, that we just talked about. And of course, there's the big challenge of unsupervised learning where there's a lot of excitement and a lot of different methods that are being explored these days. Uh, it's like the Wild West. It's not like everybody's using a variant of the same thing. These are very different approaches. Uh, so this is also very interesting. And the potential is very large, of course, for AI. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, hi. Hi. Uh, um, is there any theory or even just intuition as to why the ReLU function works so well? I think we clearly need more theory, and uh, there is some intuition. So one intuition is that it, it uh, does a kind of symmetry breaking. So because a lot of the, maybe half of the units will be off, will be in the regime where the derivative is zero, the gradients will only flow through a subset of units, and so those, uni those units can specialize more easily on their task. The other reason also is that it's equivalent to contrast, which means that you can uh, increase the, you know, the, the, the variance of the input the gain on the input or increase the weights, and you, you, you can still have the machine essentially compute the same function. It's not true with sigmoids. There is a, a built-in scale in a sigmoid or in a hyperbolic tangent, and that tends to kind of make the running difficult with many layers. And actually, good news is that theory is much easier to do on these networks of rectifier units right. than on sigmoids or hyperbolic tangent. And so there's a lot of recent theory result based on these. Yep? Hi. Yeah. I thought was, I want to ask a question for the water to vect because the water to vect was successful because it's really not a deep network. It's a very, it's a, yes. So no hidden layers. Yes. And on the other hand, like with the you know you could imagine using like ASTM, this is that. So I just wonder what's your view about like you know in the longer term. Well, how, so it depends yeah. what the task is. Uh, mm -hmm. If the, the good thing with word to vec is that it's very, very fast to train because the, the computation is very simple. So you can train on a lot more data faster. And the optimization is much easier because it's almost a convex optimization. Uh -huh. uh, but if you want to do things like machine translation, question answering, this, of course, is completely insufficient. Uh, you may want to use word to vec as initialization, but these tasks require a lot more nonlinearity and depth. And that's what we do. OK, how about, like, let's just say, not the word to vec, but the document to vec? Document to vec. Yes, so that also requires nonlinearity. Otherwise, you just get something similar to the bag of words. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. In image, in humans can recognize rotated image also. Not uh, small translations can be computed by right. uh, convolutional neural network, neural networks. But how do you handle rotation problems? Well, so the short answer is uh, people haven't really analyzed yet how the those, those generator networks actually generate images. So you, you feed them with you know, uh, rotation parameters, and they just rotate a chair. But w people haven't really kind of studied how that, how that happens in all those layers. It's kind of strange that you know, a network with uh, something like 15 layers can actually basically do graphics with uh, only kind of 15 operations sequentially. Um, it's, uh, it's a bit of a mystery. It's the first experiment, so people haven't quite figured out yet. Uh, hi, Gabriel Huang from uh, Ecole Centrale Paris, ENS Cachan, and Dassault System. I have a question for Yann Lequin, because you said that models now cheat because they use the um, smoothness of the data. And I was thinking, um, are, there, are models like convolutional neural networks smart enough now to interpolate physical uh, properties? Like if you took a few frames of someone throwing a ball, could you guess where the ball is going to fall according to the laws of gravity? Or is it too complicated for a model like CNN, for instance? So there's a bit of work like this on sort of trying to train systems to predict sort of qualitative physics, if you want. Uh, so um, an experiment that we've, um, we've done at, uh, at Facebook that we actually, it's not a paper, we just made a video out of it. It's, really, it's kind of fun. Uh, you stack uh, wooden blocks, and you ask uh, convolutional net, is this tower of blocks, uh, is it going to fall, or is it going to stay in place? And you can train a ComNet to do this, to tell you whether the tower is going to fall or not. And it can do this you know, maybe 85% of the time correctly, uh, which in the same condition is better than humans. But of course, humans are better because they can kind of turn around and, and uh, you know, in natural, uh, natural environments. Um, there are uh, experiments by uh, Roland Mimicevic, for example, in trying to kind of learn the dynamics. So you have, you know, you're observing uh, bouncing balls, and, uh, and, and you know, you're trying to get a machine to sort of predict several steps in the future where the balls are going to be and generate those images without the images getting blurry. And he has a particular architecture that uh, does, does this pretty well. Uh, there is some more recent work also. I think it's presented here at NIPS 
uh, in, um, uh, by a bunch of people from the University of Michigan, uh, Hong Lak Lee and Satin the Things Labs, where they train on uh, uh, kind of Atari video games. And, and they, they, they train a, a ConvNet taking the previous frames and taking the actions from the player, uh, you know, trying to predict what the frames are going to look, look like in the future. And it, it, it produces very good, uh, very good predictions. Okay. Sounds cool. Thanks. Uh, hi, my name is Yuri Milovano. I'm from Softstar Ukraine. And first of all, thanks for your talk. It was really great. And I was wondering if you still recommend to use RBMs or other unsupervised techniques to pre-train layers for uh, feed-forward networks, since you uh, didn't mention anything about this when you spoke about so, unsupervised learning. Yeah. So uh, pre-training, uh, you can do better than pre-training by training jointly the supervised objective and the unsupervised objective. So the modern semi-supervised techniques, like the ladder network and the semi-supervised variational row encoder do that. Uh, um, for now, these techniques are really, really uh, making a difference when the number of labeled examples, especially for the new task, is small. Like I said, like 100 examples, there's a huge gain. But if you have 100,000 examples, there is no advantage uh, for the task we're looking at now. We're hoping that with uh, you know, better unsupervised learning methods trained on much larger data sets, uh, the things are going to be very different. But that's the current status. So if you have large labeled data sets, just do supervised learning, that's it. Yeah, so my, money, my, my answer is slightly different. Uh, but you know, my money is on. Uh, sort of joint training of uh, you know, supervised criteria and supervised criteria. So things like ladder network, like stack where autoencoder that I mentioned. Uh, um, I've never used RBM. I, I don't like RBMs at all because uh, RBMs involve sampling and I'm allergic to sampling. So I stay away from it. But um, I mean, there are kind of, uh, I think, a major, a major flaw with RBMs that I, I, I don't like. Uh, we've used sparse autoencoders relatively successively in situations where the data set is, is relatively weak. It's either small or the number of labels is small, like pedestrian detection. You only have two labels. So there it helps. Uh, but if you have ImageNet, so uh, in, just turn on ImageNet. In, uh, in the case of language, there's a very, very common use of unsupervised pre-training is to get the word embeddings. So you pre-train on a very, very large unlabeled corpus of text. And then you use these word embeddings, and you can use them on the network that ha that's trained on much smaller data sets for a particular supervised task. And this is very, very common. Yeah. But uh, I think if we were able to, to, to train jointly, you we would get better results. But it's just a convenience that sometimes pre-training uh, helps. There are other forms of pre-training. You can have supervised pre-training. And that's very, very common in, in, in vision, for example. Uh, you, you train on, say, ImageNet, which is larger. And then you can fine tune on, on other tasks. Thank you very much. It makes perfect sense. Hello. Thank you for the nice tutorial. I'm from Tsinghua Machine Learning Group. And I have a question about the deep unsupervised learning. I saw, uh, I saw a slide where you show criticism about current deep unsupervised learning models, where you say the information is losing in the path from the input to the representation. I want to know more about this. Can I talk more? Well, so one aspect of this is that ideally, we'd like a representation that captures all of the aspect of the input. Right? So, uh, but, but we want to transform the space. So I had a slide here that I, I, I skipped. We want to transform the space in such a way that uh, in the new, uh, new representation, the, the, the manifold is going to be flattened. And uh, in addition, uh, the factor, the, the distribution, when you, you take the data distribution, which is very complicated, like this wire, and you project it in the space, you'd like the, the distribution to be very, very simple, maybe like a Gaussian or something like that. Um, so we haven't succeeded to do that. I mean, it works to some extent, but not sufficiently well. Um, so that, I don't know if that answers your question. OK, thank you. Uh, I have a question about. Uh, the caption generation by using attention model by Shu. Uh, and you showed a nice example of arrow, the woman of a yeah. t-shirt. And yeah. so you see there is, a, uh, it's a, there is an error. Then how we can, human can say, teach the model to say, oh, this is not clock, this is a t-shirt. Oh, How it, we can this? Oh, I, I think the answer is very, very simple. This was trained on way not enough data. Mm -hmm. It was trained on 80,000 80, sentences, uh, 80,000 images and five sentences for each of the images. 
Uh, we need to train on at least 10 times, maybe 100 times more data. We need to use uh, 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 language models, in other words, uh, use uh, models that were trained on pure text. By, by adding these ingredients, the performance is going to be a lot better. Uh, but I think uh, human learns from uh, a lot smaller data set uh, by using uh, the teacher and the parents. So is there any yes. way human can uh, involve in the yeah, training maybe. process? Um, I mean, yeah. it's just that it's hard to do research on that because uh, the, the, the loop, the human uh, in the loop is going to be uh, much slower. But, but there are ideas uh, like things called curriculum learning where we try to design a curriculum uh, that takes, uh, that tries to make the, the learner uh, spend more time on where it makes errors and things like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, you started uh, the, one of the first few slides that you mentioned. You, uh, you talked about where the power of uh, these methods come from in having a sort of really flexible prior. Uh, could you speak a bit about the research uh, which uh, you know, takes a more probabilistic uh, interpretation of these methods, or uh, is there work being done there? Could you comment on that a bit? Well, so there's a trivial probabilistic interpretation in the case of supervised learning. You're, you're, you're learning P of Y given X. And for uh, unsupervised learning, usually uh, it's more complicated because P of X is the thing we want, and it's, it's, it, it's, it has a more complicated distribution. It's not, it's not just a bunch of, of labels. And so, you know, a lot of the unsupervised learning algorithms have a probabilistic interpretation, but maybe we don't need one. What matters is that we capture what's in the distribution. So there's a lot of approaches. Many of them have a probabilistic interpretation. Uh, there's very rich literature. Uh, if you look in the third part of the book that I'm, I'm, I'm writing with Ian Goodfellow and Aaron Corville, uh, you'll see it's all of these chapters are about uh, these, these techniques. Thank you. Yeah, I have a somewhat um um, unconventional opinion on this, which is that in, in high dimensional sp continuous spaces, it's very, very, very difficult to represent densities that mean anything. And so perhaps we have to kind of revert to representing simpler objects and densities like manifolds. Um, and, um, uh, and then the, the, the analysis techniques are completely different. The, the complexity of that method is in the, the uh, sort of computational complexity of how you represent a manifold, not in the sophistication with which you represent distributions. Thank you. And one of the challenges there that we don't know how to deal with is how to evaluate unsupervised learning. So there are right. different methods, but they're not satisfactory. We don't know how to say that a model is better than another one, really. Yeah. Hello. I have a non-technical question. So uh, climate change is a major threat that humanity faces now. I was wondering if, yes. I was wondering if there is any uh, collaboration with like environmental scientists on uh, like raising awareness for uh, climate change with these deep networks that you are developing? I'm not aware of any work, uh, you know, that connects deep learning with, uh, with climate studies. Uh, there, there is work using machine learning, more traditional methods of machine learning uh, uh, for, for sort of climate change prediction and things of that type. But uh, no, I'm not aware of any work in that area. Uh, maybe you should start it. That's good. <laughs> Hopefully. OK, Henry Kautz at uh, University of Rochester. Uh, there's a natural language challenge set called uh, Winograd schemas of problems like the, the, the council refused the demonstrators a permit because they feared violence. And then the question is, who feared the violence, the counselors or the, the demonstrators? And these have been presented uh, in the AI community as, as uh, problems would be fundamentally difficult for statistical methods. Um, have you, researchers have been addressing these with deep learning? So slowly, uh, there is uh, um, there's a, um, a paper, it's a report, it's on archive by uh, a bunch of people from Facebook uh, on the, what's called the baby task or baby task, uh, which uh, is kind of a set of uh, increasingly complicated type of questions kind of tending towards things uh, like like the like, like the schema, but, but it's, it's nowhere near there yet. So I think people, I think those, those methods have to learn to work before they can run. It's, it's, not, it's not there yet. I have a question on unsupervised learning uh, from, a, from the point of view of algorithmic information theory. It is just about compression, right? And um, uh, you can measure indeed whether some unsupervised uh, 
representation is better than another one? Does it better compress the data than the other one? And uh, even decades ago, my lab, but then also other labs have shown that you can greatly profit if you first uh, compress the data unsupervised learning, predictive coding, for example, and then uh, on top of that, um, uh, do supervised learning, which is often greatly facilitated, or even reinforcement learning on top of that. So to me, it is not as obvious as it is to you that there is something basically missing and in, in, uh, some breakthrough in unsupervised learning is missing. Could you maybe elaborate again on what exactly is missing there? Well, if we knew, we would do it, right? But what we know is that it's not working to our satisfaction. Uh, one mm -hmm. thing I want to mention about compression is that compression, uh, the compression objective is essentially the same as the log likelihood, which corresponds to the KL divergence between the data and the model. But something interesting is happening with exactly. some of the new models, uh, like the GAN uh, that I was mentioning earlier, these, these generative models that uh, show these nice images. Uh, actually, they use an objective function which uh, is more similar to the reverse KL, so KL between the model and the data, or so it's a mixture between the two. And that seems to be important to generate things that are more crisp. So the, the, when you uh, train with the uh, proxy for the log likelihood, what seems to happen is you generate images that are more fuzzy. And that's understandable because of the way the model is penalized for making mistakes, which is different when, uh, from the kind of objective function we're using for GAN. So I think uh, it's interesting now we see research in alternative objective functions that go uh, do something different from the traditional log like you. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't really believe that. Uh, uh, I mean, essentially, the argument about compression is completely equivalent to maximum likelihood. So if you, if you want to. Not completely, nice, not completely, because um, one is much. the consequence of another. So why was probability theory invented? Well, because it allows you to better compress the data through Huffman coding, essentially, as soon as you have non uniform distributions. However, sure. if you look at Pi, for example, there's a very short program that computes all of Pi but the digits look random, look as if they were uniformly distributed, which they aren't. So that the compression uh, thing is more general than the whole probability and Bayesian uh, approach. They are closely related, but one is a special case of another. It's, 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 it's general. Uh, it's not always practical. I mean, the same way, uh, even more, actually, than, than sort of probabilistic methods are sometimes not practical. For example, you can't normalize them. I mean, there's kind of a similar problem with uh, where, where you know compression based on, on algorithmic complexity theory, which is that there are things in there you can prove you cannot compute. So it's kind of a bad way of basing a learning algorithm on. But, yeah, but of um, course you're looking at time-bounded versions to make yeah. that practical. Here's, yeah. here's the point, though. Uh, human babies uh, learn within you know a very short time by just moving around and observing the world that the world is three-dimensional, that you have objects that are in front of each other, they, they can occlude. They learn in a few months uh, about object uh, permanence. Uh, you know, they're not born with it. Uh, so all of that, the structure of the world, is learned uh, you know, non, un, in an unsupervised manner by babies. We don't have any algorithm that comes even close to this. So there is something we're missing, obviously. Yeah. It may not be a matter of, of grandiose principle. It's probably maybe more practical. Uh, but, but we are missing a big piece. All right. Uh, we're going to take uh, the four last questions for the four last people who are standing. And then, so don't, don't come and please. Um, hi. Uh, thanks for the tutorial. I was wondering if whether Can you speak louder? Speak louder. Yeah. Uh, would it be possible to basically use deep nets to construct global approximators for partial differential equations? How would the mixed gradient work, uh, let's say? Because then you're going to have um, something like the derivative of the gradient with respect, with respect to the derivative of the objective function to one of the variables and the inputs. So you're, you're talking. I'm not sure I completely understand. You're talking about using deep learning models to uh, to like model a phenomenon that you observe that is described by partial differential equations. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So basically, you know, what is the function that takes a neighborhood of uh, say a finite element uh, array and and then you know predicts what the next value is going to be here? I mean, that's one of the things you could use for climate prediction, for example. It might be more accurate than just actually running the equations that are known by physics because there's a lot of nonlinearities in there that yeah. you know, we can't uh, model. There's like turbulences and you know, uh, vortices and stuff like that that uh, we, we can't really model uh, because our, our you know, grid is not fine enough. So perhaps techniques like this could be used, yeah. I don't think, I mean, I, I know people have thought about this. I don't think anyone has actually demonstrated that it would work in a real environment or it works better than actually modeling the physics. And when you talk to the the computational physicists, they, they, they're very reluctant to accept that a kind of phenomenological model that tra that's trained from data is better than their uh, you know, physical-based 
the simulator. Thank you. I should say, though, there is one, one case where it uh, actually works better. So things like pr prediction of uh, protein folding, uh, learning techniques there help a lot compared to molecular dynamics. It's kind of, it's not really PDEs, but it's kind of similar. And they're much faster. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you guys for the talk. Uh, there was a slide about selecting hyperparameters. Yes. Uh, examples of grid search, uh, random search. Can we do better than that? For example, yes. using uh, distribution of the underlying data and the task at hand and have some procedures to figure out what the network structure should be and so on. Uh, so there's, a, there's actually a lot of work in this area. Um, uh, a lot of it is related to the slide we had on Bayesian optimization, where you're trying to guess which next configuration of the hyperparameters would give you the more information about the underlying solution. Um, and uh, one, one problem with these is that uh, each of the trials is very expensive because you have to, to run to train on, on you know, a whole model. But there are people who are looking at, can we use the idea of uh, sharing between tasks? So we can have, uh, think about like uh, the person who's been an expert at training a neural net for many years, they've uh, trained neural nets in uh, different kinds of tasks and different architectures. Uh, so this kind of sharing across tasks is something that's conceivable and people are also exploring. So yes, there was an example that you can use uh, Gaussian mixture models to basically approximate between points and trying to interpolate or extrapolate. Right. Can or you guess, use or Gaussian, the processes. Gaussian processes? Yeah. Gaussian oh, processes. Yes. Yeah. Can you use uh, like some representation? Uh, well, so there's also work trying to use neural nets to do that prediction. So we're seeing these two worlds coming together. Okay. Thank you. Hi, uh, thank you for the tutorial. I'm Mark Speisinger from Vitruvian Science. Uh, I'm interested in understanding the representation that these models are learning, and I particularly like the slide for the attention mechanism showing, you know, the clock uh, where right. where the model right. was thinking that error was. I was wondering what your favorite methods and what you guys use during development and research of new models to debug and visualize and kind of understand what they're learning. So that's a good question. Uh, uh, debugging is an aspect we didn't have time to cover, but it's actually very important in practice. So there are many visualization techniques people use. Uh, one of the first ones was to look at the weights in the lower layers and try to interpret them in the, in the space of the input. So if the input is an image, you can usually visualize what a unit likes as a little piece of image. Um, you can also uh, do things like track, uh, visualize all kinds of statistics uh, of what the network is doing, not just the error curve as you're training, but things like uh, how the gradients behave, how the activations behave. Um, and, uh, and there are also methods for debugging where you're trying to uh, make the task uh, he easier or harder to verify, for example, that your optimization routine is working properly. So debugging is a very, and visualization is a very important topic as well. It's particularly important because uh, you know, a, a learning system will work around your bugs. So if you have a bug right. and you train your system, it looks like it works, but it doesn't work as well as it could, but you don't realize it until you find you find a bug. And so it's very difficult to, to debug machine learning systems in general, deep learning in particular. Thank you. Hello, my name is Javier Gonzalez from NIH. Thank you for the talk. Uh, my question relates to potential medical imaging applications in which, and, and I'm supervised learning. In many of those cases, you not only will have a small amount of data that is labeled compared to the unlabeled data, but maybe also that labeled data might not, optimally, might not be optimally labeled or sometimes incorrectly labeled. Is there any particular approach or architecture that you recommend for cases like those? Thank Are you. Are you talking about images or about uh, you know, clinical data in general? I'm particularly thinking about functional neuroimaging. OK. Um, so the, the field of applying deep learning to, uh, to essentially volumetric medical images, you know, whether it's uh, fMRI or uh, you know, CAT or PET or whatever, is, is, very, is, is just beginning. There, there's only a few people who kind of have the, the right set of uh, expertise of people to kind of put together uh, an effort to work on this. So there are a few startups also that have started working on this. Uh, but it's a very nascent field, as far as I know. Uh, there's quite a few people also working on just you know, clinical data that are not images for um, uh, designing uh, uh, treatment uh, uh, procedures, for example, and predicting what the outcome of a particular treatment would be. Um, in particular, uh, my colleague at NYU, David Zontag, is working on this kind of stuff, and there's uh, quite a lot of people are getting interested in this, in this as well. And um, there's, there's a huge poten you know, potential impact 
uh, beneficial impact on, of uh, deep learning in this area. So. And it's clear that transfer learning and unsupervised learning are something, are things that are important to keep in mind when designing systems because of the reasons you're saying that in some cases you have very few labeled examples. Uh, so I think those people in the community are doing exactly that. Thank you. Well, that was a full, uh, full half an hour of uh, over time of uh, questions. Um, let's uh, thank uh, the speakers again. Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available.